Let us remain standing just a moment as we bow our heads now and look to the Lord. If there's any request to be known to God, would you just now at this time raise your hand to Him like that and hold on your heart what you want. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for another day, and now it's beginning to mark up. It'll be history. The services of this morning is already passed. The words that's been said is in the air, on the tape, and we'll have to meet it someday. It'll either have to be right or wrong, and we're, we believe that it's right because that it's your word. Now we pray that you'll grant to us tonight the request that we're asking. With our hands we raised, asking for a request that thou didn't know what we had need of and what we're asking for. So we pray that you'll answer us, Lord, and give us the desires of our heart. That is, if we can use it to honor you. Grant it, Lord. Heal the sickness in the midst of us. Take away all sin and unbelief. Give us a, thy, a portion of thy blessings again tonight, Lord, as we meditate upon the Word in the time that we're living. We have assembled together, Father, for no other purpose but to try to learn how to live better and to live closer to you. For we see the day approaching, and we must assemble ourselves together off and take instructions from you. Amen. Grant it, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Amen. I know it's awfully warm and place all packed out the way it is, and so we're sorry we don't have the, any air conditioning, and I, maybe that'll be these two things that I want to do for the church as soon as I can get back in the way I want to, if I can get back in the meetings properly. I want a, a piano where it sets this way so the pianists will be looking towards the congregation. I want an organ over on this side and an air conditioner. Then I feel like I that be it. <laughs> and so we are, we'll trust the Lord and know that He will grant it to us. Um, I believe He told me Brother Hickerson just tucked this out of the magazine, he put it on my desk back there. That is that constellation of angels that's in the magazine that was uh, spoke of. See the pyramid shape? Look at this one on this side, the pointed wing coming with his chest out like that on my right-hand side as I spoke from this same pulpit months and months and months ago. See? There it is. And Look mag or Life magazine has it, the, um, uh, the May issue, May the 17th, I believe it is. Is that right? May the 17th issue. Mrs. Woods was telling me today that many called her and asked. That's in the May issue, May the 17th. It's a mysterious cloud. The cloud is 26 miles high and 30 miles across. And that's what we were speaking of here. And that's where the angel of the Lord came down and shook the place. And the whole it sound louder. I know there's one man. If I think Brother Softman, I seen him a while ago somewhere. He's here. He was standing. Yeah, right back here. He was standing near when it happened. I guess I wasn't too far from him. I just seen him. Tried to wave to him, only I had his binoculars, that the, the uh, animals in which we were hunting had, wasn't on this hill, and I went on the other hill. I found them the day before and told them where to go to. And I went over here where if they come this way, I would just shoot up in the air and run them back that way so that they could get their, their, their animal. So javelina is what it was. And so I went over on this side, and it wasn't, there wasn't on either side. And I seen Brother Fred walk out, and it wasn't there. He went back, and Brother Norman went over the hill, and I turned, went down in a little chasm, and come up just by myself about a mile and a half through some real rugged country. And I was sat down and was just looking around. He's getting up in the day, and I was picking those what we call their goat headers. It's something like a burr. Picking them off of my trouser leg, just exactly the same kind that I saw myself doing when I was here telling you about the vision six months about before it happened. And I said, that's strange. And look how perfect north I am of Tucson. Kind of northeast makes Tucson. You remember, I said, a little southwest. And I said, that's strange. And I was looking at the, at the burr like this, picking them off of my, many of them, off of my uh, trouser legs. If you've never been there, that's a desert country. It isn't like this at all. About 
20 times brighter and no trees and things like there is here. It's just cactus and sand. So uh, I was just looking at it like that. I just raised my eyes up and about, I'd say, half a mile from me, I saw a whole head of, a herd of javelina laying, coming out on the end where there's eating some fillery. And I thought, now, if I can just get Brother Fred and Brother Norman to there, that's just the place. And the evening before, the Holy Spirit was so tremendous in the camp that he was telling me things that had happened and had taken place. I had to get up and walk away from the camp. And then uh, that next morning, I went up there, and I started, I said, now, if I can get to Brother Fred, I'll get him around this mountain, which is about a, a mile this way. I had to go about a about two miles or better to pick him up, maybe three. Back this way down this, uh, what we call hogback, come up like this, up top of these rugged, jagged mountains and run down this way, cut across and come over and go down in this direction and pick him up. And then you have to go plump to the bottom of the hill to get Brother Norman, which would probably have been about four or five miles, then get back and I was going to put a, a little piece of Kleenex. At the, I was going to hang on a piece of of the mesquite there so I could point myself to which ridge to go out when I come back. And I just come up over a little ridge where there's a lot of jagged rock and there's a, a deer trail come down the other side about all 40, 50 yards beneath the cliff. It's about, oh, it's up in the day, I say, 8 o'clock or 9. Would you think something like that, Brother Fred, maybe 9 o'clock, something? I run over on this side quickly to keep the javelinas from seeing me. They're a wild boar, you know, and they're pretty scary. So I, I went over the hill this way and cut, started running up the hill and it just run along in a little, what we call a dog trot. And all of a sudden, the whole country just rung out. I never heard such a terrific blast. Just shuck and the rocks rolled. And I felt like I, I must have jumped five feet off the ground. Looked like it just, just scared me. And I thought, oh my, I thought, I'd gotten shot that somebody I had on a black hat. I thought they might have thought it was a javelina running up the mountain. Somebody had shot me. It went so loud right on me like that. Not all at once, something said, look up. There it was. Then he told me, the opening of those seven seals, turn home. So here I come. I met Brother Fred and Brother Norman about an hour later when I found them. They were excited and talking about it. And there it is. Yeah, and science says that it's impossible for, for any kind of a, a mist or anything to get that high, fog, vapor. See, it'll only go just... I wouldn't know. I, I, we, when we go overseas, we travel 9,000 feet. That's above the storms. That's approximately about four miles. And say, let's say, maybe it's 15 miles till you can't get any more vapor. But this is 26 miles. And she hung there all day. They don't know what it is. But thank the Lord. Amen. We do. Amen. Thank you, Brother Hickerson. Um, uh, keep it on my desk in there. When we write the book, well, then we can have it. I got a little note here was given me. Uh, I believe there's been an increase in our number since I was here last. Uh, I think his name, or at least his father's name, David West. Got a little fellow here that they want to dedicate to the Lord. Is that right? Was it tonight or was it Wednesday night? I don't know. It's got um, tonight. That's fine. Well, what about you're David, aren't you? That's what I thought you were. All right. How about bring the little fellow up? If our sister will come over here to this piano and give us a song of bring them in. The pastor, if you will, come up here and we'll dedicate this little boy to the Lord. Now, we try to keep it scripturally. This is your grandson. Right. <laughs> Don't seem possible, does it? Sister West, what do you think about that, isn't it? You know what I think, oh? You know I'm grandpa too. <laughs> it reminds me of Brother Demas Shakarin. You're standing before a great crowd of people and he gets everything mixed up like I do, you know. He was standing there, he said, you know, I said, I, I told Rose I felt, as his wife said, felt lots older since I was grandma. He said, oh, I'm a grandma. <laughs> you know, I, you're not alone, Brother West. There's a lot of them in here. And um, it's all right. 
I think we can really appreciate our grandchildren. Uh, and this don't hope this don't sound bad, but we can have more time with them, I believe, than we did with our, our children. And I asked the wife that other day. She said, "Sure, you can love them a little while, and turn back over to their mother, and go on." <laughs> Now I've got a little grandson back there. He said, Papa, preach, Papa, preach. <laughs> and they took up the offering last Sunday night and had it laying on the table, and they brought him in back there. And, and he heard me through the microphone. He said, Papa, preach, Papa, preach. And Billy said, Yes, up there. And he said, No. And the offering went all over the floor. <laughs> he wanted to come out here. He wanted, and he's always hollering at me, you know, see me at any convention, and he yelled, Papa, preach. So <laughs> I know they're to say, I wonder if I could borrow some of that hair. You don't see it right now. I do. <laughs> What's his name? David Jonathan. Isn't that a beautiful name? Well, I hope his life takes after the ones that he's named after. David, the King David, who Christ is to set on his throne. And also of Jonathan, the beloved friend. I... I tell you, they're lovely little fellows. We appreciate them very much. I, he's waking up, and he can he can holler amen and do his rest of them, you know, so we just don't let it bother us. He's dedicating him to the Lord. I think it's mighty sweet. Have a young couple that God has placed in their care, a little fellow like this, and come to give him to the Lord. Amen. And when you do that, it shows that you are not that you are giving back to God that what God gives to you. Amen. God bless him. Now, if you were to hold him, I think maybe the mother could hold him a little better than I could. Now, how about us just laying hands on him? Would you rather do that? Because I'm afraid of I drop him. Or not drop him, break him or something. You know? <laughs> I'm always afraid of breaking him. You know? My immediate said back there, I think this is one job at the platform. She kind of envies me. You know, she likes to hold the, well, look at you. He's going to look at me. He's a fine fellow. Yes, sir. Maybe I could hold him. I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he don't fall. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Isn't that cute? Oh, you do. Well, that's sweet. Let us bow our heads. Lord Jesus, many years ago, when Christianity was born in the form of a man called Christ, the anointed Messiah, Jesus, was his name. The people brought their little infants to him that he might lay his hands upon them and bless them. And he said, Suffer, little children, to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. This lovely little couple, their grandparents and them have been true followers of the word. Lord Jesus, I bring and hold to you tonight, the pastor and I, this lovely little David Jonathan with. I give him to you. From the mother and daddy, I present him to you, Lord, for health, strength, a long life of service, to honor God Almighty who brought him into this world. May the blessings of God rest upon him. May the Holy Spirit rest upon this child as there is of tomorrow. May he care of the gospel that his parents and grandparents so cherish today. Grant it, Lord. I, in the name of Jesus Christ, I give you this child and a dedication of its life. Amen. I believe you want to take a picture of the little child. I jumped too. <laughs> God bless you, sister. May you ever love and cherish the Lord Jesus and the little fellow be raised in the admonition of God. And have a wonderful little boy, I'm sure. God be with you. I believe he dropped his little pacifier. Did he get it? Oh, my. Now, let's sing that little song. Bring them and everybody together now for the little fella. All right. Bring them. Bring them. Bring the little ones to Jesus. I don't know better hands to put them in, do you? Amen. The hands of the Lord Jesus. Now, I know it's hot out there. Now, I want to say to the janitor, my brother, or doctor, other them takes care of it, some of the sisters are ruining their skirts on the, uh, on the grease that's on the chair. How many got some of it on them? I know this 
my wife, my two daughters, little Betty Collins, Miss Beeler, some of them, it's something greased on there. If you take a look at it, Doc, when you can. Um, so I believe it's where they, it's a grease or paint or something right where they work up and down the seats. And um, it isn't. Well, I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> something. I just, just mentioned to me and I said, I'll mention it to, to Doc. All right. Now, Wednesday night prayer meeting. Is there any other, you got your announcements in, Brother Neville? The announcements all in. Now, if the Lord willing, uh, next Sunday morning, I want to speak on the subject of indicting this generation for crucifying Christ. You say this generation couldn't have done it. We'll find out whether they did or not, according to the Word. Now, next Sunday morning, if the Lord is willing, if now, if, 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 Something occurs. I'm supposed to be in Houston this week also in a convention, and that take me through Sunday, so I don't know whether I'll be able or not. But we got a couple more Sundays to play on uh, before it. Anyhow, and then we go to Chicago for the convention or meeting in Chicago last week and this month, and then I have to take the family uh, back to Arizona for, for their vacations over in the kiddies has to go back to school. Now, how many enjoy the reading of the Word and the blessings of the Lord? We all do so greatly. Now, it's hot, and I know some of you goes back home tonight, and old brother Rodney and Charlie and them has to drive a long ways, and wait a minute, you're on vacation, aren't you? Well, I hear you going fishing. The Lord don't lock time to the man when he's fishing. You don't get any older while you're fishing, so now you girls go with him. <laughs> and, uh, I'll come down and join you if I can. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the good Lord, they said, don't lot time to a man when he's out fishing. Do a lot of it. When you, when you feel all twisted up, it's the best thing to relax on I ever found in my life, is to go fishing. I had a little card one time from Mr. Troutman. Anybody remember Mr. Troutman, the ice company in New Albany? He had a little card on there that said, out fishing. And he went ahead and said, a man that has, uh, every man his brother's out fishing. With a helping hand, he'll always land out fishing. He had about eight or ten different things. Then when he got out to buy him, said, Man is close to your God when he's out fishing. <laughs> so I think that's about right. The rich and poor are all the same out fishing. See? A helping hand, he'll always land out fishing. <laughs> and everything was about out fishing. Well, I'll tell you another fishing I've been doing for about the last 33 years has been fishing for the souls of man. May the Lord help us to win every one that we can find. Now, tonight, this is taping. Now this morning, if Jim is here or taping, uh, I think on the tape somebody called my attention to it, uh, said the second exodus. I didn't mean second, it's third exodus. The Holy Spirit in the form of a pillar of fire, God coming down in manifestation, brought out the first exodus and, and back in, uh, brought Israel out of Egypt. The second exodus was Christ bringing the church out of Judaism. And the third exodus is when the same pillar of fire takes the bride from the church. See? Out of the natural, out of the spiritual, and the spiritual out of the spiritual. The three, see? The spiritual out of the church, rather. And then we get the three, the three ages of it. Now, tonight, I uh, wanted to make another tape, uh, and that was called, Is Your Life Worthy of the Gospel? Probably wouldn't take very long, or just some scriptures and notes I got here. But first, we want to read God's Word. Before we do that, we just bow our hearts to Him just a moment. Lord Jesus, any man physically, or woman, or child can move back the pages of this Bible, but there's no one that can reveal it but You. I pray, Lord, of taking this text as it's placed upon my heart to send out across the nations for the people, that they might know what type of life is required of them to live. For so many has asked me, is the Christian life a life of church service? Is it helping uh, the poor or the needy? Or is it a constant member? Is it a, loyal, a loyalty to the church? And such questions. Father, may the correct answer come tonight through these words as we make an endeavor to, to bring them to the people. In the name of Jesus Christ, 
We ask that. Amen. Now, turn in your Bibles to the, the book of St. Luke, and we'll start at the 14th chapter and the 16th verse to read some scripture for a basis, for a background for this that we're going to try a lot about 30 to 40 minutes on. Now, the 16th verse of the 14th chapter of St. Luke. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bid many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for, for all things are now ready. And they all with one accord begin to make excuses. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must need go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of ox, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and showed his Lord all these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Notice it's not servant, servant. Go out quickly into the streets and the lane and the cities, and bring in hither the poor and the main and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. The Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now, did you notice? There were three pulls or three turns of it. When they went out first and called to them that were uh, are bidden to come, and they didn't do it. So they went out a healing campaign, went out to get the blind and halt, and still there were rooms. So he went out and compelled the good, bad, and indifferent that they should come in. Now you read another parable of this, something on or of, in Matthew 22, 1 to 10, if you'd like to read it later on. But I, I drew this subject from there. Uh, is your life worthy of the gospel? Now, Jesus here is saying man has always tried to make excuses not to receive God's word of his invitation, though it be firmly proven to him that it's, that it's his supper and his invitation, but man is constantly making excuses. And if you read St. Matthew uh, 22, you'll find that the excuses were made there also. And, and they try, it went back into all ages. Went back into the age and said a man uh, bid them and had a vineyard. And we find that parable. And how he sent his servants to collect from this vineyard. First servant come, what did they do? They run him off. The next servant come, they also stone him. And they run servant after servant off. The cruel man, the king, sent finally his son. And when his son came, we find out that they said, This is an heir. We'll kill him. Then we'll have all things. Then Jesus said to them, The king sent forth and slew those murderers and burnt their cities. Now, we see when God gives a man an invitation and to do something or to receive the invitation that he's given him and he returns it down, then there's nothing left after mercy is spurned by judgment. If you step over the boundaries of mercy, then there's only one thing left, and that is judgment. And we find that man has done that in all ages. 
It's happened most every age in the Bible. When God sent Noah, his servant, and made a way of an escape for all the people who wanted to, to be saved. But the people only laughed and scorned at Noah. But God made the way, but they had an excuse. It wasn't according to their, to their uh, modern thinking. It, didn't, it wasn't the way they wanted it. So they made excuses in the days of Noah. They made excuses in the days of Moses. They made excuses in the days of Elijah. They made excuses in the days of Christ. And they make excuses today. Now, him speaking directly to Israel, the ones that was called to the feast, that I would also apply today to man the church who has been bidden to come to the feast and won't do it, the spiritual feast of the Lord. And they won't do it. They don't want to do it. They've got other things to do. They find excuses. Now, if Israel 2,000 years ago would have accepted the invitation that they were given, they wouldn't be as they are today. 2,000 years ago, Israel turned down the invitation to come to the wedding supper. And they turned it down and went into judgment. But as Jesus said, they stoned and killed the prophets that was sent to them um, by making excuses. Now, the excuses they made in each day, we find in the days of Jesus, that he didn't, uh, he didn't affiliate with any of them. They said, when did this man get this learning? What school is he from? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is his mother called Mary? Is his brothers Joseph and James, and so forth? And is his sisters with us? Then where did this man get this authority to do this? In other words, he didn't affiliate with him. So they said he's Beelzebub. He's a Samaritan. He's got a devil and he's mad. He's a, he's a, he's a man that's got an evil spirit on the line of religion and has drove him crazy. And that's what he's out there like a wild man. Don't pay any attention to him. And we know what happened to Israel. Uh, they screamed out. They were so sure that that man was wrong. Until oh, when they condemned him, he said, he said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And it's been there ever since. Jesus was trying to tell them that their excuses was what killed the prophets and what killed the righteous that come. They accepted their creeds that man had given them instead of taking the Word of God and by doing so had made the Word of God of no effect. Now, you've either got to say in this that this is God's will and God's desire or either something else that you can crop up that's better than what this is. Now, you have to take one or the other. You can't serve God and man. And you've got to say this is the truth or that's part of the truth. Or it isn't all the truth. Or it isn't put together right. Or it isn't interpreted right. And the Bible said that the Word of God is no private interpretation. No one else is supposed to put an interpretation to it. It's written just the way God wants it interpreted. Just what it says, that, that's what it's supposed to be. Just take it the way it's said. Which it's wrote down here. Now, they ex accept their creeds. They make God's uh, promises of no effect to them. They bypass that. Just skip away from it. Now, if Russia had accepted the Pentecostal blessing 75 years ago when the Holy Ghost fell in Russia, they wouldn't have been communists today. Now, 75 years ago, they had a great revival in Russia. God come among them, and they had great revivals way into Siberia. And what did they do? They rejected it. And today, the country is gone, and the churches can't have church uh, only on their permission, and they are doomed into judgment as gone off on this wild tantrum of communism sold out to the devil. Fifty years ago, the Holy Ghost fell in England. 
Just after that come George Jeffries and F.F. F. Bosworth and Charles Price, Smith Wigglesworth, those great warriors of the faith fifty years ago and offered England the Holy Ghost revival. But what did they do? They laughed at them, put them in jail, called them crazy, thought they lost their minds. The churches refused the people to come hear them. And they healed the sick and cast out devils and done great works. And because that England as a nation rejected the gospel, her, her sins is known throughout all the world. There's hardly a, a more of an apostate a nation in all the world, even including Rome and France, than England. She's a mother of apostasy. Right where uh, Finney and many of the great men preached in the Haymarket and Charles G. Finney and Wesley and on down, and she turned it down and down. Even last week or two in the papers, you find out where their great man has so weakened to the, to the sect of women until spies come in and their head man found some more of them. The magazines has packed it. Their sin of scandal right in their government has sold their disgraceful name across the world. Why? She rejected the truth. She had her excuse. And she's finished. England is all washed up with God a long time ago. If America, 15 years ago, when the great healing revival continued on from Pentecost, broke out in the nation, and there was the revivals on the capital, Washington, D.C., the presidents, vice presidents, Great people, governors, great things taking place. Governors and, and men were healed. Like Congressman Upshaw had been a cripple for, for 66 years. And they could not turn their face and say it wasn't so. It was right before them, but they turned it down. And tonight, that's the reason this nation stays. She's doomed. There's no hope for it at all. She's crossed the line between judgment and mercy, and she's elected in what she has here to control the nation, and she's rotten to the core. Her politics is rotten. The morals of this nation is lower than anything I can think of, and her religious system is rottener than the morals. She becomes, in doing this, she is now joined herself, all these churches and the, the nation, into the Federation of Churches, and has taken the mark of the beast. What a thing. Why? Christ gives them the opportunity. Come to my feast, the Feast of Pentecost, which means 50. When the Holy Spirit poured out on Russia, they was called to a Feast of Pentecost, spiritual feast, and they turned it down. England, the Holy Ghost has poured out upon them, and they turned it down. America, the Holy Ghost has poured out upon them, and they turned it down. He bid three times. Three times he sent out. And they did not listen to the feast. Then he sent again. And he said, go and compel those people to come. The table's got to be set. The table's ready. There's still room. And I believe that maybe, maybe within the next few months or something or a year or whatever it is, God's going to send another shaking across the country for there's somebody still out there somewhere that's a predestinated seed that the light has to fall on somewhere. It's somewhere in the world. The nation itself is gone. I was looking in this week's Life magazine down at the well, down at the Little Rock the other day, or, or rather Hot Springs, and there I seen, I believe it was a governor of the state of New York, 
with some kind of a strip tease over in Hallelujah, dancing with her. Now, and yet below that was another renowned man. Oh, what a disgrace! Look at our nation today. Look at the condition of our, of our nation. Look where she's went to, how low she's sunk. Look at our religious system today. How can it be that the churches can ever get into the condition that they are now? It's because they have rejected and refused the message of God, the invitation to come to the feast. Could you call a life like that worthy of the gospel? Could you call a life that could set and permit their, their people to do the things, to smoke cigarettes? The other day, down here at a certain church, a little league team was playing down here at the park. And my uh, brother-in-law's little boy is a pitcher uh, for one of the teams. And so he's out there pitching. And there was a church league playing. And there was a pastor with these little fellows out there on the ground playing. And the pastor smoked cigarette after cigarette of a real neighborly church right here by us. And could you imagine a man and even people sitting in the audience noticed it. But it's getting so that they don't even pay any attention to it. A certain great church, a Baptist church that I know of. Let's the church out from Sunday school 15 extra minutes so that the pastor and all of them can stand outside and smoke before they come back in to serve the duty of the law. John Smith, the founder of that church, prayed so hard that God sent a revival till his eyes swole shut at night and his wife had to lead him to the table and feed him with a spoon. If that man would turn over in his grave if he knew that church had gotten that condition. What is it? They were bidden to come and turned it down. That's the only thing. And you remember Jesus said in here that those that were bidden and turned it down would not taste his supper. When God sends the Holy Ghost and knocks at a man's door and he deliberately turns it down, sometime he's going to turn it for his last time. And then you won't be a privileged character you can sit in a church and listen to the gospel and agree with the gospel. You might do so much as say, I know it's right, but never put a finger on it to help it yourself. See? You just listen to it because you say, I believe it's right. That's just sympathizing with it. I could say, I believe that's a $10,000. That don't mean I got it. See? I could say, that's good cold water, but refuse to drink it. You know what I mean? And this is eternal life. And to refuse to do it, one day you'll cross the line between judgment and mercy. And then you won't be, have the privilege to come and receive it. To you people who come here, I'm not responsible for those who are, are other ministers are speaking to, but if it's right, you owe your life to it. What more could you ever find that would be more of a benefit to you than to know that you can have eternal life? What if I was giving away capsules here that scientifically proven, scientifically proven, that this capsule would make you live a thousand years? Well, I'd, I'd have to get a militia out here and swore them away from the place. You wouldn't have to make an altar call for it. You'd just have to beat them away from it to live a thousand years. And yet, scientifically proven that the eternal God, all of His power of His resurrections was promised you eternal life. And Satan will put his legions out there and keep you away from it. Yeah. Yet you can look, it's sensible enough to look in the face of it and see it's right. But then turn it down. See? Something, some kind of excuse. It's too hot. I'm too tired. I will tomorrow. Just some kind of an excuse. That's all they do. By rejecting the day of visitation, 
It separates you from God. Now, we notice and in the Old Testament, they had what they called the Jubilee year. That was when all the people that was slaves could go free when the Jubilee sounded. And then if the man did not go out, if there was some excuse that he could give that he didn't want to return to his land, then he had to be marked in the ear with an awl by the post in the temple. And then no matter how many Jubilees come along, that man was sold out. He could never no more come back as a citizen in Israel no more. What did he do? He rejected his invitation. He didn't have to pay nothing. The debt of his slavery was over. His family was free. He could go right back to his homeland and get his own possession. But if he refused to do it, then he wasn't allotted no more with Israel and his possession was given to another. Now, the same thing in the natural applies to the spiritual. That if we, as inheritance of eternal life, and we hear the gospel and know that it's true and we reject it and refuse to do it or to listen to it, we take on the mark of the beast. Now, somebody said, now there's going to be a, a mark of the beast. It's going to come someday. Let me tell you, it's already come. Yeah. As soon as the Holy Ghost begin to fall, the mark of the beast begin to take place. See, you only have two things. One of them is accept it, takes the seal of God. To reject it takes the mark of the beast. To reject the seal of God is to take the mark of the beast. Everybody understand? To reject the seal of God is to take the mark of the beast. For the Bible said, all that was not sealed by the seal of God took the mark of the beast. When the trumpet sounded and all wanted to go free, could go them, it didn't was marked. Now, you see, the mark of the beast, if we talk about it in the future, is when it's going to be made manifest. When you realize that's what you've already done. See? And so is the Holy Spirit. It's to be manifested. When we see the Lord Jesus coming in glory and feel that transforming power and see the dead rising out of the grave and know that a second longer we'll be changed and have a body like His, it'll be made manifest. Then to see those who rejected it will be left down, out. Didn't Jesus said? The virgins went out to meet Christ. Some of them fell asleep the first watch, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, to the seventh watch. But in the seventh watch, then came forth the sound, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go out to meet him. And the ones that were sleeping awakened. All the age back to Pentecost. Woke up. See, from the seventh age, the seventh church age, all the way back to woke up and these that were in this church age of living, they were changed. And they went in. At the very time they went in, the sleeping virgin come and said, we wrote to buy some of your oil. But they said, we just got enough for ourselves. Go to them and sell it. And while they were trying to receive this oil, the bridegroom came. There has never been a time in the history of the world that the Episcopalians, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, the papers are full. The religious papers are praising God that those sleeping virgins are now trying to receive Pentecost, trying to receive the Holy Ghost. And don't the people realize that it will not happen according to the Word of God. While they were trying to come back, the bridegroom come and tuck away the bride, and they were cast into outer darkness for judgment. Because they rejected their invitation. All peoples are bidden to come. God in every age has sent out his light, and it's been rejected. And now, today is no different from any other day. To reject the day of the visitation. When God is making a visit to the church and to the people, receive it then. Don't put it off till next year, the next revival. That's the hour today is the day of salvation. And remember, God has never sent a message in any day but what he vindicated with the supernatural. 
Jesus said himself, If I do not the works of my Father, then believe me not. But if I do the works, you believe the works if you can't believe me. Well, you see it clearly cut and, and made manifest. Now, the time has come that she rejects it. Then she's bored in the ear with an awl. Then she'll never hear it. Now she takes herself to the confederation of churches to go right in to take the mark of the beast. One of the great ambitions. Somebody give me the paper in just now. The, this new pope has said is to unite the churches together. They'll do it just as certain as I'm standing here and the Protestants fall for it. See, because the church, it, the Bible said, Paul, the prophet of the Lord, said that day will not come except there come a falling away first. And then the man, before the man of sin will be revealed, he that sitteth in the temple of God, upholding himself all that's above God, he as God, forgiving sins on the earth and so forth. How that this thing happened, but it couldn't happen until the falling away, until the church began to get away from the spiritual feast, draw itself back and organize itself. And then the revelation didn't stay with the church. Remember, Israel walked day and night by the pillar of fire. When that pillar of fire moved, they moved with it. And remember, it was a fire at night and a cloud of day. So it might come day or night, any time. But wherever it was, there was a propitiation made that they would not fail to see it. It was a light at night and a cloud in the daytime, and they followed it. Yes, sir. The same thing. Martin Luther saw it. What did he do? He come out of Catholicism. But what did they do? They built a little fence around and said, We're Lutherans. This is it. Then Wesley saw it moving away from there. He went. What did they do? Build a little fence around and said, This is it. What did I do? Moved right on again. Pentecost saw it. What they do? Moved out of the Westland and Nazarenes and so forth. What did they do? They built a little fence around called We're Oneness and We're Trinity and We're the United and all this. What did he do? God moved right on out of it. See, we cannot do that. We've got to follow every day, every hour of the day, every step of the way. We've got to be led by the Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't, we take an organizational life. And a life that doesn't follow Christ daily is not worthy. A man that's a Christian on Sunday and goes to church, sits back there and thinks he owns the church because he does this, that, or the other, and on Monday will steal and lie. And women that will go out on the public beaches and, and out upon the streets with immoral clothes on. I thought of, of, of the First Lady... Wouldn't he put on makeup to go before the Pope and come back and set a waterhead haircut uh, uh, spree for the women in the nation? And all these uh, dresses that once she's become mother, every woman in the country wants to wear one of them uh, mother-type dresses now. That's right. It's examples that they know that those people that do that, they take on a spirit of the world. And that don't belong in the church of the living God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Women ought to look to Jesus Christ. Amen. You ought to look to Sarah in the name of the Old Testament. Now they got so that I was preaching the other night somewhere about a women to obey their husband. Obey? <laughs> that went out of marriage rich a long time ago. But um, they ain't going to do that. No, sir. They live in America and they let you know so. <laughs> They're not going to obey, but as long as you don't do it, don't never try to call yourself a Christian. Because you're not. I don't care how much you dance and speak with tongues. If you don't obey your husband, you're out of the will of God. And a woman that wears shorts and does these things that she does on the street, don't call yourself a Christian. You want to have the world and still hold your testimony. You cannot do that in the presence of God when you know better than to do it. Notice, bored in the ear, marked away, then you'll never hear. Remember, that's a sign of closing the ears. You won't hear it no more. You won't listen. You'll never be able to get to it again. Oh, she don't believe that. Oh, my, don't tell her she believes it. No, she tell you right, she don't know it. How could a, a lady, just to ask you, how could a lady, as I spoke Sunday, last Sunday night, a week ago tonight, on a uh, red flashing light, how did... The, 
the, the run of women has become prettier than it ever was. Now, that's nothing, nothing against the woman. Now, that's just, but how she controls that. See, the, she's got that way to put her in a temptation, like Eve was put before the tree. Every man, every son that comes to God's got to go through that hour of testing. This is the age of women. This nation is. Or she has to go through that testing. If she can be a pretty woman and act like a sister, the Lord's blessings upon her. But when she can get herself to, to know this and display herself, absolutely shows that she's got a, a bad spirit on her. She don't mean to be that way, I don't think. Many of them don't, but they don't realize that. Could you tell me that a decent thinking woman could put herself on these little uh, uh, clothes that they wear out here on the street? I've got two young girls sitting here. I don't know what the outcome of them kids will be. I just pray for them. Kids today, I don't, you can't tell. I don't know. They're not immune from that. They've got to stand on their own two feet before Jesus Christ and give an answer. They can't go in on what, on, on what I believe and what their mother believes. I don't know what to do, but I actually believe at this hour, if them girls went out on the street with them kind of clothes on and a man insulted them in them kind of clothes, I don't believe if I had the opportunity I could even condemn the man. Right. I'd condemn the girls. They had no business doing that. Listen, if man thinks that, and they teach that man's no more than an animal, he come from the animal race, and look then, and you put him out there like you take the dog to the little female at certain times, through the fences and everything else, because the little female is in that condition, hogs, cows, every other animal, and if we are animal life, which we are, the physical part, and then when a woman displays herself like that, she proves that she's the same thing the little dog is the same thing. Exactly. For she wouldn't be doing that. She knows nature teaches her that man's going to look at her. And the Bible said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. That puts a testing time. And the devil pretties them women and strips them down and set them out there to give you a test. Man, turn your heads. These sons of God. Amen. Women, you dress like daughters of God. Amen. Don't answer for adultery yet today. If that woman, no matter how innocent, she might have never done nothing wrong. Never even had it in her mind to do wrong. But when that sinner who looked upon that graceful form of that woman, knowing he's a male and female sex in and, and, and one glance and one and male in the other, and that sinner's going to have to answer for it at the day of the judgment, who did it? Who's guilty? Not him, you. There you are. Immoral. Look at this nation. It used to be when they, they had the knee-high dresses that the women wore, we had to send to Paris to get them. Today, Paris sends here to get them. It's got so filthy that Paris can't keep up with it. That's right. The whole, why? Rejecting the gospel. Why? Paris didn't have it. It's 100% Catholicism. Yeah, the Protestants can't even get in there. Look at Billy Graham. I think there's only 600 Christians in all Paris. Out of the millions. 600 Christians, Protestants. That's not Holy Ghost filled. That's just absolutely Protestants. 600 of them out of the millions times millions. They didn't get the opportunity to reject it. But these people has the gospel. And when they get away from the message and the gospel that they've seen demonstrated, make fun of it because some old prostitute doctrine has weaved them around in some pastor standing in the pulpit thinking more of a dollar and a meal ticket than he does of the soul of people that he's preaching to. Right, that's what's done it. Now she leads the world. Remember not long ago in this tabernacle, I preached on a subject about 20 years ago. I'll show you the goddess of America and had the little flapper here sitting there with it. That's what it is. Now, they're even get it, they're getting what they've asked for. And they're going to get it, that's all. Oh, they won't believe it. No, sir. They let you know they're American citizens and they got a right to, to function any way they want to. I just wish, let me tell you, I'll tell you now, 
No, sir, politics will never work. No, sir, democracy will never work. Amen. Democracy's rotten to the bone. Amen. If it could be run amongst a bunch of Christians, it would be fine. But when you put it out there in the world, it becomes all sails and no anchor. Amen. Exactly right. Look at here today. Anything can take place and there'll be just... Anything, pull a few politics and you will get by with murder. When I preached down there that night to try to save them two kids' life, they're as guilty as guilty could be. Even that attorney got up behind me there and he said, It's right. He said, I don't believe in taking the people's lives. He said, If you'll notice on your criminal records, who is it that gets killed? Electric chairs and things. It's not the rich. He can afford to get him a lawyer and some, pull some dirty tricks and some wheelchair and some over here and bribe the thing. He says, it's poor kids like that. It ain't got enough money to buy them a decent meal. That's the kind of guess it. That's the kind of electrocute. Somebody is uh, like they call a bunch of ignorant people and they just hold up their name of capital punishment. I said, the first murder was ever committed in the world. One brother killed another. God did not take his life for it. He put a mark on him that nobody should take his life. Right. That's the supreme judge. Amen. Now, see, they took the sentence off of him. Now they're going to get another trial. Of course, he'll get life now, which will be 11 years, and maybe stand for parole. They're guilty. Certainly they're guilty. They ought to be set to penitentiary for a lifetime, but not their life. Take, no man has a right to take another man's life. No, sir. I don't believe in it. No, indeed. Oh, they say, well, they don't believe that they're out of the will of the Lord because that's all they know about and all they want to hear about. They... Turned an ear against the truth, and there. Neither did Egypt want to know that that bunch of holy rollers down there was the will of the Lord. How'd they want to know that some crazy man come in there from the wilderness with whiskers hanging down like this and said, Pharaoh, I come in the name of the Lord. Turn them children loose. Pharaoh would say, Who? Me? <laughs> Throw him out. <laughs> See? Me? If you don't do it, the Lord's God go to smite this nation. The old, the old crank. Turn him out somewhere, let him go. The sun has kind of baked his mind, see? But it brought judgment. Because a man was a prophet and had thus saith the Lord. Exactly right. They didn't want to believe it. Rome didn't want to believe it either. But it happened just the same. Israel didn't want to believe it. That was the Messiah. How could a bunch of, bunch of Galileans and aren't all, all these Galileans? Where did they come from? What kind of a crowd does he go with? The very poorest that can be got together. That's the crowd he associates with. That's who comes to hear him. It's the poor people. They're people that don't know nothing. They're not elected. They're not, they're not the intellectual type that we are. They're a poor bunch. You heard say about the revival in this day. What kind of crowd hears them? What kind of goes to these meetings? What kind of people are they? I heard a fellow say not long ago, well, he was kind of a, he was Hope's stepfather. And I was telling him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, now, who would believe a thing like that unless some kind of a bunch like you got up there? He said, you let so-and-so a businessman, you're the town, a wicked is all, let him say that he received the Holy Ghost, then I'd believe it. I said, don't worry, he'll never say it. The man died instantly without God. See? Be careful what you're doing. Be careful what you're saying. You want a life worthy of the gospel. Right. Israel didn't believe it, that bunch of people, that madman. The name of Jesus of Nazareth, born, they thought, an illegitimate birth. And the people believed it because they said that wasn't his, why, his father's Joseph and Mary was to have this baby before he was even born. Why, it's illegitimate. What is he? Just a madman. He's one of them funny sort of a guy. Don't go to hear him. What did they do? They were sending their souls to hell. They talk, Jesus said, let them alone. If the blind leads the blind, don't they both fall in the ditch? Right. They didn't know it. They wouldn't believe it. They could not. They could not see how that a simple people with a simple message to be rejected could cause a great nation to fall to ruins. Now listen. They could not understand that a simple, ordinary, common bunch of people. You know, the Bible said that the common people heard Jesus gladly. I had a little something that happened in Mexico not long ago. General Valdinia, elected of God, 
The light shined across this path once in one of the meetings. That great Catholic warrior, one of the highest generals in Mexico, come humbly to the altar and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He went back down into Mexico. He kept crying to me, come down there. Finally, I decided to go down. The Lord led me. Had a vision. Told my wife. Went down there. And when he did, he and being one of their chief generals, four-star general, he went to the headquarters of the government, and they, they're hard against Protestants down there, you know. So they know this is going to be a terrific meeting. So he went down there and got a militia guard. And when they did, they got the big arena. And they're just going to bring me in like that. The government was bringing me in. So when they did, the... The bishop, one of the great bishops of the Catholic Church, went up to him to the governor and said, Sir, I understand that you're bringing in a non-Catholic. He said, Yes. What about it? Why? He said, You can't have a man like that in here. This government has never known to do a thing like that, but said, We've done it now. He said, Well, I said, The man's a reputable man. I understand that thousands of people comes out to hear him. General Valdinia, he's my bosom friend. He said, and uh, the, uh, the, the president himself is Protestant, you know, Methodist. So he said, uh, he said uh, the man's a reputable man, as far as I know. said, General Valdini here, he's converted under this man. said, well, he's, uh, as far as I know, a reputable person. said, thousands of people that claim will come hear him. And this uh, bishop said, what kind of a people is it, sir? Just the ignorant. That's the ones that go share a person like that. The president said, sir, you've had him for 500 years. Why are they ignorant? <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> that settled it. <laughs> oh, my. That dehorned him. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Then when that little baby was raised from the dead, I sent a runner behind the man. The lady was saying in Spanish, the baby died this morning at 9 o'clock. And it's pouring down rain, having about 10,000 converts to Christ each night. The night before, an old blind man uh, had received his sight on the platform, oh, three or four times size of this tabernacle, about that high of old shawls and hats laying. And I just, they let me down on ropes in the ring to get me in. I just walked out there and started preaching by faith. Billy comes and said, Daddy, you're going to have to do something to that woman. I said, I got 300 ushers standing there, and they can't stop a little bitty woman weigh 100 pounds nearly. And pretty little lady, about so high, about, oh, maybe her first baby, I'd say she's 23, 25 years old. And she's standing there and her hair hanging down and holding a little baby. And she'd make a lunge for that line. The man would push her back. She'd climb up over the top of him, that baby on her hip. Anyway, go between their legs or anything. They'd get her up and have to kick her off the platform. And they'd handle a prayer card to give her. He said, if I let her come in there, Daddy, with that dead baby with no prayer card, and said them others standing there has been standing here two or three days in that rain and sun, and let the, her get ahead of them, Said it'll cause a, a fuss down there. I said, that's all right. Brother Moore was there, and he's kind of bald-headed like me. And I said, she don't know who's who. So many people. I said, Send, and, and a couple of brethren, one of the brethren from your tabernacle, that um, he's gone to glory. Now, I can't think of his name just at this time. But he was standing back there. So I said, Brother Moore, go down and pray for the baby. She'll never know who it was, me or you. Just go on down. And not able to speak English. And so uh, Brother Moore said, all right, Brother Brandon, start walking down. I said, as I was saying, faith, and I seen a little baby, a little Mexican baby sitting in front of me just laughing. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> and I said, let the little lady through. Billy said, I can't do that, Daddy. She, I said, I saw a vision. Billy said, oh, that's different. So he opened up the crowd like that and brought her through. Here she come falling on her knees uh, with her prayer beads in her hand. I said, get up. So I said, Heavenly Father, now I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know where you just want me to satisfy the woman by praying for the baby or what. But I said, I lay my hands upon the little baby in the name of the Lord Jesus, just the same things it did to Brother Way, laying there on the floor dead the other day. And the blanket kicked, and that little baby started screaming, and it was to its life. When I said a runner, Brother Espinosa, to go with her to the doctor and get a sworn affidavit from the doctor that baby died that's by 10 o'clock that night died that morning at 9 o'clock in his office with pneumonia you got a sworn statement from the doctor the papers couldn't keep that still you know so they had to come over and they interviewed me and they said to me he said uh, do you think that our saints could do that too I said if they're living oh he said you can't be a saint until you're dead <laughs> there you are see and the people you see the other day where they had this None. They played up in the paper, so a new saint died all oh, a hundred years ago or something like that, and they made a canonizer now, made a saint out of her, 
And it said that she come back from the dead and prayed for some sick person that had leukemia. What is them on the magazines? Just think, now they try to play that up. And one of these hundreds and hundreds of cases right under the nose of the people here, what's that thing for a thing to play the Protestant church right into it? See, make it think something, and then the real works of the Lord were perfectly vindicated, proved they are daring to touch the paper with it. There you are. They received an invitation and turned it down. Yes, sir. They can't understand how a simple message, a simple people, if you reject a thing like that, would cause them to go into chaos. A woman said to me, Grants Pass, Oregon, some time ago, a Catholic girl come out there to condemn and write up to a newspaper report, a pack of cigarettes in her hand. And she said, I want to talk to you. I said, what does she want to say? She said, I want to ask you some questions about this religion of yours. And I said, what is it you want to ask? And she said, by what authority do you do this? I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, by a divine call. And she went ahead and smartened off. I said, just a minute. She said, if I had to associate with that bunch of ignoramuses up there, she said, I wouldn't even want to be a Christian. She said, and if they, they say that them people will rule the earth someday, she said, I hope I'm not here. I said, don't worry, you won't be. I said, you don't have to worry about that. Well, she said, all that they're carrying on is screaming. I said, and you claim to be a Catholic? She said, I am. I said, did you know the Blessed Virgin Mary had to receive the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues and dance in the Spirit the same way they did before God would receive her? You call her the Mother of God? She said, that's nonsense. I said, just a minute. Uh, I'm not supposed to look at the Bible. I said, then, how are you going to know what's truth or not? She said, I'll take my church's word. I said, this is God's word. Here it is right here. I'll challenge you to look at it. And Mary was with them up there in the upper room and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I said, that's me. And you call her the mother of God. The Lord. I said, then call that bunch of trash backwash. I said, don't worry. You won't be there. You don't have much to worry about if that's all you got to worry about. You better worry about your own sinful soul, girl. And I let her go. Now, think of all this. A simple. God makes it so simple. How could Ahab how could Jezebel, how could those people who thought that Elijah was a witch, thought he was a spiritualist, even Ahab said, here's the one that's caused all this trouble to Israel. He said, you're the one that's troubled Israel. How could that nation think that to reject the message of a fuzzy-faced man like that, no priestly garments on and so forth, would be the condemnation of it? How could Egypt they rule the world. Pharaohs and his class and dignity of the world has never come to that place again. And science and so forth. How could they think to reject an old prophet of 80 years old with whiskers hanging down, gray hair stomping out of there, a fugitive, and come out there with a message, you'll either let him go or God will destroy the nation. How could Pharaoh... You obey me, Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, obey. Oh, him, Pharaoh. <laughs> and an old man, some old crank, that thought turn a guy down like that, destroy this, but it did it. Oh, my. Let's stop, pause a few minutes, and have a prayer and think. What day are we living in? Where are we at in another modern scientific age? We better think. Maybe if you stop, people stop and pray a little while and think a little bit, you feel better if you get through doing it. That's right. A Christian is not a tool or some kind of a mechanical wrench to a great big religious regime. That's right. A Christian is not some kind of tool that keeps a religious organization moving. A Christian, that is not a Christian. A Christian is to be Christ-like. And a Christian cannot be a Christian until Christ comes into the man the life of Christ in him. Then it produces the life that Christ lived. And you do the things that Christ did. What am I talking about? Personal relationship to Christ. What is it? Is your life worthy of the gospel? Now, I'm trying to lay that background there to show you that men and women who were renowned women, man, the Bible said, if you notice last Sunday night, something I forgot to put in, Genesis, the sixth chapter and the fourth verse, those men who taken to them women for wives were men of old renown. Renowned men. Predicted to come again like it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Renowned men taking women, not wives, women. 
going after strange flesh. Look in England a couple weeks ago. Look in the United States. Look everywhere. It's full of prostitution. Great men, great high offices, bringing disgrace upon the nations, running after women. That great man there in England, some kind of a warlord like. Why, well, did you notice he had a pretty wife? Her picture was there long. Look at that Russian prostitute. But she's all sexy dressed and throwed herself out there to display her female flesh, and the man fell for it. What we need today is sons of God. We need man and government as sons of God. That's right. Therefore, a good godly king would stop all this nonsense. There wouldn't be no strings to pull like David did. He put a stop to it. <laughs> Certainly did. Because he was a king. And there was only the real way is God being the king and God sends a prophet. Didn't Samuel tell them before they ever got a king? He said, God's your king. Have I ever told you anything in the name of the Lord but what come to pass? They said, no, that's right. Have I ever bummed you for your living? No, you never did bum us for a living. Now, I've never told you nothing but what was right before the Lord said, God is your king. Oh, we realize that. We know you're a good man, Samuel. We believe the word of the Lord comes to you, but we want a king anyhow. That's what they did. Pentecost wanted an organization anyhow. It got it. Right? Want to be like the rest of the churches. You are. Go ahead. That's just what it takes. But God is our king. God is our king. Yes, sir. What is it? It's because that the people, like they did in the days of Christ, like they have in every age, they find an excuse. They have their own creeds. You might not want to say, I, I bought a cow and I've got to go see whether she, she uh, will work or not or give milk or uh, what stock she is. You might not have that excuse, but here's the kind of excuse that people make. Say, I'm a Presbyterian. We don't believe in that. I'm Baptist. We don't believe in no such stuff as that. Well, I'm a Lutheran. Well, that don't have anything to do with it. That don't mean you're Christian. That means that you belong to a bunch of people that's organizing. You belong to the Lutheran Lodge, the Baptist Lodge, the Pentecostal Lodge. There is no such a thing as Pentecostal Church. There is no such a thing as Baptist Church. It's Baptist Lodge, Pentecostal Lodge, Presbyterian Lodge. But there's only one church and there's only one way you can get into it. And that's by birth. You're born into the church of Jesus Christ and a member of his body, of the spiritual delegation of heaven. And then the signs that Christ is with you lives through you. Christians, oh, you must have a personal relationship to God. In order to be a son of God, you must become relation to God. He must be your father in order for you to be a son. And only his sons and daughters are saved. Not the members of a church, but sons and daughters. There's only one thing that will produce that. That's the new birth. The new birth is the only thing that will produce relationship to God. Is that right? Sons and daughters. Then, when this takes place, then the man, here's the question I want to get to you. The man says, what do we do then? After we've been born again. So many ask me that question. What should I do then, Brother Bram? If you are born again, your entire nature is changed. You are dead to the things you once thought. Well, you say, Brother Bram, when I joined church, I got that. Well, then when God said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever, he still heals the sick, he still shows vision. But, Brother Bram, in my church, now you're not born again. You can't be. For if the very God if his life is in you like you are in the life of your father, and if the very life of God is in you, and the very spirit that was in Christ in you, how can the spirit live in Jesus Christ and write this and then come back down in you and deny that? Hmm? Can't do it. It'll punctuate every word to be so. Then, if you say, well, I'm a good member of the church, that don't have one thing to do with it. I know the heathen down in Africa amongst my dark brethren down there. I find the morals of them people higher than, than 90% of the American people. While in some of the tribes there, if a young girl is not married until she's a certain age or when she's a certain size and no one has taken her yet, they know there's something wrong. 
They excommunicate her. She takes off tribal paint and she goes to the city and then she just becomes a renegade. And when she's married, she's tested for her virgency. If the little virgin veil is broke, then she has to tell who done it. And they kill them both together. Wouldn't there be a lot of killing in America if that taking place? Hmm? Then you call them heathens. Oh, my. They could come teach people that call themselves church members how to live clean. Right. Never found one case of a nail in the whole trip through South Africa. You don't have such a thing. There you are. See, it's just our own dirty, filthy ways. It's white people. That's right. Got away from God. When this takes place, the thing you do then, you'll find out that the spirit that comes in you from the new birth, you will believe and do everything that God says in his words for you to do. And everything that the Bible quotes for you to do, you'll punctuate with amen. amen. And you'll not stop day and night until you receive it. Amen. Right? Right. And in all this time, you'll certainly above everything bear the fruit of the Spirit. You say, well, I speak with tongues. You might do that, and you might not. Well, I shout. You might do that. You might not. But there's one sure thing you will do. You will bear the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, faith, long-suffering, meekness, gentleness, patience. Your temper will not be loose. Just remember, when you got that, that poisons the Holy Spirit away from you. When you get to a place that you want to fuss with everybody you come along to, there's something wrong. When you get a place where the, a minister will read from the Bible that it's wrong to do a certain thing, and you just remember there's no Christianity there at all. That's, now, that by their fruits you shall know them. That's what Jesus said. See? If it's the Word and God said so, that Spirit in you will cope with that Word every time. Because genuine Holy Spirit will cope with the Word because the Word is life in Spirit. Jesus said, My words are life. And if you've got eternal life and He is the Word, how can the Word deny the Word? What kind of a person would you make God? That's one thing to know that you're a Christian, when you can fully agree upon every word of God, and you find yourself in love with your enemy. Somebody said, well, he's nothing but a holy roar. And you start to get, oh, be careful. Be careful. But when you really find yourself that you love him, regardless of what they do, you still love him. Mm -hmm. Then you begin to find, and your patience gets from about that long because you just don't have no end. Anybody just keeps saying things about you? I don't care what you say. Don't get stirred up. If you get stirred up, you better go pray first before you talk to him again. Yeah. No. Don't get in fusses. Don't like to get in fuss. If you like to see somebody raised up in the church, say, you know what? I'll tell you so-and-so did so-and-so. Say, nah, brother, shame on you. Now, if you say, oh, is that so? Listen to that scandal. Watch out. The Holy Spirit's not a cesspool. No, 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 no. The heart is occupied by the Holy Spirit. is full of holiness. Amen. Purity thinketh no evil, doeth no evil, Amen. believeth all things, endureth long suffering. See? Don't fuss. When the family gets in a fuss, don't fuss with them. Your mother said, I ain't having you going up to that old church anymore. What you, all you think about now, you let your hair brush look like some old grandma. Don't fuss with her. Say, okay, mother. It's all right. I love you just the same, and I'll be praying for you as long as I live. Okay. Now, don't fuss. See, temper breeds temper. First thing you know, you greet the Holy Spirit away from you, and you'll be fussing back. Then the Holy Spirit takes its flight. Right. Temper breeds temper, and love breeds love. Amen. Be full of love. Jesus said, This will all men know you're my disciples when you have love one for another. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love. And did you know you are a little creator yourself? You know that? Certainly. You've seen people that you just love to be around. You don't know why. Just that loving type of person. Haven't you seen that? Just as kind. Of, you like to be around them. That's, they create that atmosphere for the life they live, the way they talk, their conversation. Then you've seen those 
that every time you, you shun them, all the time they want to talk about something evil and talk about somebody, you say, oh my, there they come. They're going to criticize somebody. They're, uh, he's in here now. He's going to talk about this man. All they're going to do is tell dirty jokes or something about women or uh, something like that. You just hate to get around them. See, they create seemingly pretty nice people, but they create that atmosphere. And the things that you think on, the things that you do, the actions, the things you talk about, creates an atmosphere. I went into a man's office here in this city, and a man is a trustee, or deacon it is, in a fine church. And I went in there to see that man about some business, and there's a radio over there with that rock and roller twist, there what it was, just as hard as it could go, and I guess there was 40 pinups in his office of nude women. Now, you can't tell me how much deacon or how much more. You let me see what you look at, what you read, and the kind of music you listen to, the crowd you associate with, and I'll tell you what kind of a spirit's in you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You hear God say, me, do so-and-so, uh, that bunch of... Just remember, I don't care what he says, his words speaks louder, his actions speak louder than what anything he can say. He could testify, say as a Christian, sure, and maybe do anything, but you just watch the kind of a life he lives, that tells what he is. Now, could you imagine that a man with a life that would say, to believe in divine healing, that's something for the birds. That was back in years ago. There's no such a thing today. Is that a life worthy of the gospel that Christ was wounded for our transgressions and with his stripes we were healed? You say, but I'm a deacon. I don't care. You might be a bishop. When I heard Bishop Sheen say about two years ago, coming down every turning moment again, when he said, a man that would believe and try to live by that Bible was like somebody trying to walk through muddy waters. Bishop Sheen then turned around and said, when I get to heaven, uh, you know what? When I meet Jesus, I'm going to tell him, I'm Bishop Sheen. And he said, oh, yes, I heard my mother speak of you. <laughs> Paganism! Man, that would blaspheme that word. God be merciful. I ain't the judge. That word's the truth. That's right. The Spirit of God will recognize his own writing. He's identified by his writing. It, it, it speaks of him. And you're identified by believing it. That it gives you your credentials of identification. Don't fuss with others. And don't, uh, and don't have these family fusses. As I said, love breeds love and temper breeds temper. Now, now let's watch. Look at Jesus just for a minute. He was your example. I hope you're not getting too tired. Look, let's look at Jesus just a minute. He was our example. He said so. For I have given you an example that you should do to others as I've done to you. Now watch. When he came into the world, when there was more as much unbelief in the world right then as there ever was, it didn't even slow him up. He went right on preaching just the same and healing just the same. Never bothered him. There was critics the man was criticized from the time he was a baby until he died on the cross. Did it stop him? No, sir. What was his goal? Always do that which the Father has written. Always do what's pleasing. Look at Jesus. Talk about us humbling ourselves when God himself became a baby. Instead of coming in a, a little crib somewhere in a decent home, was born out there over a manure pile in a stable. Amongst ball and calves, they wrapped him in swaddly clothes off the neck of a yoke of an ox, the poorest of the poorest, and yet the creator of heavens and earth. One cold, rainy night, they said, Master, we'll go home with you. He said, the foxes has holes and the birds has nests, but I don't even have a place to lay my head. God, Jehovah, humbled himself and become a man represented in sinful flesh to redeem you and me. Who are we then? He was our example. Who am I? Nothing. I was telling someone this afternoon in a little meeting, I said, every son that's born of God has to be tried first, chastened. And I remember when I had mine. Oh, my greatest hour, when a, when a man's born again, there's a little spot like the size of his fingernail that God injects into him system, and it falls into his heart and their anchors. Then Satan makes him prove it. And if that ain't there, you're gone. 
I remember there in the hospital, I was about 22 years old, 23 maybe, long as young man, and my father dying in my arms and me talking to God as a healer. And my own father in a heart attack laid his head in my arm and me praying for him and see him turn those eyes and look at me and fall off to go to meet God. I took him over and buried him by the side of my brother and the flowers are still fresh on his grave. And me preaching a God that heals the sick, working for the public service company for 20 cents an hour. And my wife working out in the shirt factory to help us make a living for a little 18-month-old boy, Billy Paul, and an eight-month-old child that she was packing. I seen Sister Wilson nod her head. She remembers that. Roy Slaughter and some of the old timers. What did I do? Walk the streets with a sandwich in my hand, come down off the pole and testify and everybody come by about the love of Jesus Christ. Go to the garage and ask them if I could use it, talk to the mechanics. Go in there and say, man, have you ever been saved yet? I found something in my heart. Go into grocery stores at nighttime. Come home at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning from making sick calls all night long. Couldn't it just sit down, change, put on my work clothes and sit there in a chair and rest till daylight, get up and go and so Seeing from fasting and praying till I had to pray to put my spurs on to get up a pole. Preaching. And preaching, God was great. God was mercy. God was love to the people. And here, my daddy dying on my arms and my brother died, was killed while I was standing in the pulpit down here at this little colored Pentecostal church preaching. Come told me your brother was killed up on the highway. Your car hit him and killed him. His own brother's blood dripping off his shirt where he picked him up on the highway. Right after I buried him, my daddy died. Then there laid my wife out there, and I went to come over here at this tabernacle from off this waste platform stand, told the people six months before it happened, there will come a flood, and I seen an angel take a rod and measure 22 feet over Spring Street. Sandy Davis and them said in your life, says only about 8 or 10 inches in 1884. Boy, what's talking to you? I said, it'll be because I seen one of them trances, and they told me so, and it'll be there. And there's a mark on Spring Street today of 22 feet of water. I said, I rode over the top of this tabernacle in a boat, and I did. During that time, my wife got sick. I prayed for her, and I come to the tabernacle. There's people waiting on me. I said, uh, she's dying. Oh, it's just your wife. I said, she's dying. I went over there and prayed and prayed and prayed, and I hold my hands out, and she took hold my hand. She said, Billy, I'll meet you in the morning standing over there. She said, get the kiddies together and meet me at the gate. I said, just start hollering, Bill, I'll be there. And she went out. I laid her down there in the morgue. Went up home to lay down, and when I did, little Billy Paul was standing, Miss Broy and him, so sick the doctor expected to die at any time. Me praying for Billy, and here come Brother Frank and got me said, your baby's dying, the little girl. I went up to the hospital, and Dr. Adair wouldn't let me go in. said, she's got meningitis, she'll take it back to Billy Paul. Have the nurse give me some kind of a red stuff to take for some kind of an anesthetic of something to quiet me. And I had him to leave the room, throw it out the window, slipped out the back door, went down to the basement. And I laid the baby there before the hospital, the isolated ward. Flies all in her little eyes like that, and I tucked the old mosquito bar, shoot him away, and put it over. I got out, and I said, God, there lays my daddy and brother yonder, the flowers on the grave. There lays Hope laying yonder, and here's my baby dying. Don't take her, Lord. And he just pulled down the curtain as if they shut up. I don't want to hear you at all. He wouldn't even talk to me. And then if he wouldn't talk to me, it was Satan's time. He said, I thought you said he was a good God. What's all this you're hollering about? You're just a boy. Look around over the city. Every girl and every boy you ever associate with think you've lost your mind. You have. Now, he couldn't tell me there's no God because I'd already seen it. But he told me he didn't care for me. But all night long, all day long, I said that to God. What have I done? Show me, Lord. Don't let the innocent have to suffer for me if I've done wrong. I didn't know he was trying me. But every son that comes to God's got to be tried. I said, tell me what I've done. I'll make it right. What have I done but preach all day long and all night long and just uh, give me my life constantly? What have I done? Satan said, that's right. And see, now when it comes to you and you've told all of them that you believe that he's a great healer and there lays your baby laying there dying. He refused as even you and your wife died with tuberculosis pneumonia. You said he could heal cancer. And there he is. Now you talk about him being good and how good he is to people. What about you? Then I begin to listen to him. That's reasoning. I thought, that's right. said, he could tell you, you don't have to speak the word. Just look to your baby to live. I said, that's right. And as much as you've done for him, and yet that's what he does for you. 
I said, that's right. I began to think, well, what? See, everything began to break away when it comes to reasoning. But when it comes to that, that hung. It stayed there. I was just about ready to say, then I'll quit. But when it got down to all the reasoning powers that broke away, then it come to that eternal life, that new birth. What if it hadn't have been there? What if it hadn't? We wouldn't have known one another the way we do now. This church would have not been here like this. The thousands and millions around the world. But it, thank God it was there. Yeah. Then when I thought, what? Who am I anyhow? Who am I to question His Majesty? Who am I to question the Creator to give me my very life here on earth? Where did I get that baby? Who give it to me? Not mine anyhow. I just loaned her to me for a while. I, I said, Satan, get away from me. I went over and laid my hand on the baby. I said, God bless you, sweetheart. In a minute, Daddy will take you down and put you on Mommy's arms. The angels will pack your little soul away and I'll meet you in that morning. I said, Lord, you give her to me. You're taking her away. Oh, you slay me like Job said. Yes, I love you and I believe you. If you send me to hell, I love you anyhow. I can't get away from that. There you are. So such a thing as these things, they've never been on that sacred ground. As I was speaking this morning, they know nothing of it. How can they say that they're children of God and deny the Word of God? How can you do it denying the very Holy Spirit that bought you? Oh, just remember, Jesus humbled himself to death for you. He was not fussy. When they spit in his face, he didn't spit back. When they pulled his beard out, he didn't pull it theirs. When they slapped him on one side of the face to the other, he never slapped them. He prayed for them. Walked on humbly. He was an example of humility. He was full of faith. Why? Why? He knew his words couldn't fail. He was so lived by the Word that he became the Word. Oh, God, let me hold my both hands to God before this audience. Let me live like that. Let this Word so become that me and this Word is the same thing. Let my words be this Word. Let the meditation of my heart, let him be in my heart, on my mind. Tie his commandments upon the post of my intelligence. Pie him upon the post of my heart. Let me just see him when temptation rises. Let me see Christ. When things go wrong, let me just see him. When I get ready and the enemy will try to make me get angry, let me see Jesus. What would he do? He was so much in the Word that him and the Word became the self-same thing. Watch. He didn't have to fuss. He knew he and the Word was the same. He knew that he was God's Word made manifest. And that God's command would finally conquer the world. He knew that His Word, He had faith. He knew where He was at. He didn't have to discuss and say, Here, you could come over here. The devil said, Now look, you can perform miracles. You know you've got great faith. You can perform miracles. I'll build you a building twice the size of Oral Roberts. Because <laughs> the people all, if you all think you have to do, show them. Jump off this building here and just go right down because it's written. And the angels there at the earth at the same time dash foot against the stone. See? He knew he had power. He knew that he could do it. He knew it was in him. But he didn't want to use it till God told him to. See? He wanted to be God and Him be the Word at all. And he knew that when he spoke anything, that it was God's Word. And though heavens and earth pass away, that Word would someday conquer. Amen. He wasn't fussy and stewy. He spoke just the words of God. Every word that come from his lips was God's anointed Word. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could say that? My Word and God's Word is the same. What I say, he honors it. Because I do nothing till he tells me first. There's your example. There's a life worthy of the gospel. Not those priests that were so educated and polished and having all those great dignities and stand and make long prayers and devour widow houses and devour the high seats in the, in the congregation, all these things. That, they was, that wasn't a life worthy of the gospel. But he was worthy of the gospel. So much that God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. 
My word is he. He is my word. He and I are the same. No. Watch this now. He knew that his word would finally conquer the world. He knew where his word came from. He knew it could never fail. That's why he said, both heavens and earth will pass away, but my word will never fail. He could say that. That was a man who him and God's word become the same. He said to them, you will do this and that. He said, who can condemn me of sin? Who can accuse me? Sin is unbelief. If I, by the finger of God, cast out devils, who does your sons cast them out by? See, it wasn't that, so it had to be something else. See? If I, they said, well, we've cast out devils. He said, if I do it by the finger of God, a vindicated word of God, then who does your sons cast them out by? Then you be the judge. <laughs> the people of his days and the people of, of, of Christ, uh, made fun of him, talked about him, but he, he humiliated him every way they could. Told him of all kinds of evil against him, but he went on. Now, I want to close in a minute by saying this. The people of this day are a bunch of neurotics. The people of this day are a bunch of neurotics. They are afraid to take the promises of God. Church man, church organizations, church organizations are afraid to take the challenge of God's Scripture for the, this day. They realize they realize that their modern conditions and their social gospel as they preach will not meet the challenge of this hour. No more than Samson could meet it in his condition. It took God. And here's a program that promised it. I'll get to that just in a minute. I want to hold that word a minute. Though they call themselves Christian, they adopt creeds, man-made creeds, to take the place of God's Word. So they can take the creed because the man made it. But they're afraid to lay their faith out there in the God that they claim that they love. Right. And then you say that life's worthy of the gospel? Can't be. Though they be church members. But that's not worthy of the gospel. No, indeedy. The gospel, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. These signs shall follow the believers. And when you deny that to follow the believers, how can you have a life? No matter, you might not never say a bad word. You might keep all the Ten Commandments. That won't have one thing to do with it. It's still not worthy of the gospel. See? It couldn't be. Those priests kept that and still was not worthy. He said, you're your father the devil. Who could lay a finger on one of them men? One guilty mark. And they were stoned without mercy. Holy man! And Jesus said, you're of your father the devil. When the gospel came into it. Well, they call themselves Christians. They love to go to the creeds. The uh, creeds. Oh, the creeds institutes and fulfills the thinking of the modern people of this day. And a man that's going to be a success in this day has to go with the modern trend of thinking. Let me say that good and clear. See? A man, if you're going to be a success, you have to go with the modern thinking of this day. They're going to say, oh, isn't he a darling? Isn't he wonderful? He can just stay there so straight, and he never keeps us over 15 minutes. And our pastor don't always bawl us out about these things. Shame on that pastor. Any man that can stand up open and look upon the sin of this day and not cry out, there's something wrong with that man. He's not worthy of the gospel that he claims to be preaching. That's right. So, by doing so, they make themselves excuses by saying, Now look, my congregation, a, a man come here not long ago to a certain great church, and he was writing a thesis, and he said, I'm writing on divine healing. He said, Brother Branham, we love you in our denomination, one of the greatest denominations, one of the greats of the nation, or the world. And he said, uh, we love you in this denomination. He was right here at the Jefferson Villa. But said, I've come to find out about this divine healing. He said, there's only one fault that my church really finds. So he said, you associate around too many Pentecostals. I said, well, now you know that is right. I said, that's true. You know, I've always wanted the opportunity to get away from them. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll come to your town. You get your church to sponsor me. Oh, he said, they would. I said, that's what I thought. <laughs> that's what I thought. He said, you see, my denomination won't stand for that. That's as much excuse as I married a wife or bought a, a yoke of ox. Yeah. 
I don't care how many doctor's degrees you've got and how much you're looked up to by your denomination, that sort of a ministry is not worthy of the gospel that's wrote in this book. Right. Any church member that'll side in with such stuff as that and call themselves a Christian and go out there and live and the women bobbing their hair and wearing clothes that the Bible says for them not to. Man carrying on the way they're doing now a form of godless taking drinks and smoking cigars and marrying several times and becoming deacons of the church and even pastors and so forth. And the people that put up with such as that, that sort of life is not worthy of the gospel. A woman that'll walk and get on the telephone and tattle and start fusses in the church and things like that, that isn't a life worthy of the gospel that we're trying to represent. Any person that'll break up a church and start a feud between the people and things like that is not worthy of the gospel that we preach. Exactly. It's a form of godliness denying the power thereof. The power of God that keeps you from such. Notice. Now, they don't do it. They just won't do it. They have the excuse that their church don't believe in it. They want well, Jesus to say, say to a man tonight, speak to his heart and say, I want you to go preach the full God. My church doesn't stand for it, Lord. You excuse me if you will. I've got a fine charge. I, 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 you know, I'm a pastor of one of the greatest churches in this city, Lord. Oh, we praise your name down there. Yes, sir, we sure do. I can't do it. The same excuse. Same thing. So they don't come to the spiritual feast of his promise, vindicated word. Did not Jesus say, where the carcass is, the eagles will gather? Amen. Eagles, not Amen. buzzards now, eagles. Amen. Where the slop is and, a, and a, a carrion, then the buzzards gather. But where the fresh, clean meat is, the eagles will gather. Okay? Certainly. Where the word, eagle food, they'll gather. So they don't come to the spiritual feast that they're invited to. Do you believe that God has given America an invitation the last 15 years to a great revival, to a spiritual feast? Did they come? No, sir. No, sir. Then to reject to come, is that life worthy of the gospel? Though they call themselves that? When a man come to me not long ago and sat at a table and said, Brother Branham, I want to reach across the table a great man. I want to take hold of your hand. I love you. I was in a church and heard him preaching. He said, I love you. I believe you're a God's servant. I said, thank you, doctor. I love you too. He said, I want to tell you how much I love you as a brother. And said, you see my little queen sitting here, my wife? You remember her? And I said, I do. said, the doctor give her two weeks to live with sarcoma's cancer. And you come to the city and you prayed for her and looked up and saw a vision and looked back and told me, thus saith the Lord, she'll be healed. Great spot in her back, sunk in like that, looked like a great big, uh, like the uh, part of a woman's breast pulled inwardly in her back, right on her spine. There's not even a spot of it today. That there sits my queen a living today. So how could I do anything but love you for praying that prayer of faith? How could I keep from bleeding you to be a, a servant of the Lord when you saw me and told just exactly what would happen? He said, now I've got something for you, Brother Branham. He said, I belong to the greatest... Pentecostal league there is. I said, yes, sir, I know that. He said, I talked with a brother not long ago, and they told me to get in contact with you and tell you that it was a shame that you took that God-given ministry to a bunch of people off the river and around like that. I said, is that right? He said, yes. He said, God sent that ministry to hit the nerve spot, the big spot, the highlight. I seen the devil talking right there, and I thought, yeah, Jump out off this mountain and show, you know, off this building, see? see? I thought, just lead him out a little far. My old mother used to say, give the cow enough rope, she'll hang her own self. I said, is that right? Yes. I said, it's a shame, but what you do? I said, what are you? I said, day you can hardly buy yourself a meal. And he said, look at old Roberts and them stepped in and got out there with the one hundredth of the ministry you got. And look what they go. I said, yeah, that's right, see? And he said... My group will take you. We'll take you right in as, as one of our brethren. They'll all give you the right hand of fellowship, and we'll charter a plane and give you your wages of 500 a week or more if you want it. And we'll send you to every major city in the country. This happened right in Phoenix, Arizona, right across the table. And he said, and we'll pay you. He said, then let the world, the outside world, let the dignitaries, the big guys, the up and up. He said, you're always talking about the down and out. We got the up and outs. 
But let them see the hand of the Lord, and I let take my wife along, and others can prove that those things that you say comes to pass. I said, yes, sir, that'd be great. And I see the man in the position of a D-L-L-L-D, a writer of books, see? doctor of literature, fine writer, fine man. See, he didn't know the Scripture. Did you know that angel that performed them kind of works never did go to Sodom? He stayed with the called out group, Abraham. He just didn't know it. I just let him alone. Just sat there a little bit. And I just wanted to see what the catch was. And I said, well, uh, uh, what would I have to do? I said, well, Brother Bram, uh, just the only thing they said, we discussed it, a few things, little petty things that you teach that you just lay them aside. And I said, for instance, what, brother? <laughs> well, he said, your baptism, you know. You know, you kind of baptize like the one or something like that. Said, little things like that. I said, oh. I went ahead, and he said the initial evidence, and women preachers, and just a few little things like that. I said, uh-huh. I said, you know, I'm surprised that one servant of God would ask another servant of God after paying the tribute to me, you did, and calling me a prophet, and knowing that the word of the Lord, or the revelation of the word, comes to the prophet. And you turn around, Dr. Pope, and don't speak of your good intelligence and would say and ask one servant of God, you asked another servant of God to compromise on the thing that it means more to him in life itself. I said, no, sir, Brother Pope. By no means would I do it. No, sir. What is it? It's a grain of eternal life. Live or die, whether you're a great guy or not a great guy. I passed by the other day, no disregards to these two men. I looked over there, and there was a great picture there, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Old Roberts knew a place coming, a seminary, to educate ministers. It's going to cost, and I know Dima Shikarian, Brother Carl Williams, and them that are on the board of trustees of it, $50 million with a $3 million building a Pentecostal boy. That's a great lot that God has done for him. Now, I think, me with a seminary, I'm against it to begin with. And I said... The future home of Oral Roberts' great seminary went on down the road. There was a great modern thing, and Oral Roberts in a little ragged tent come to my meeting over in Kansas City, Kansas. They said the future home of Tommy Osborne. Oh, man, about a three or four million dollar place going up like that. And there was Tommy Osborne, one of the finest Christian men. He's a real man, a real God sent man. Stood right across the street there, a little nervous boy, little boy and girl in a car, running around. I said, Brother Branham, I was there when I seen that maniac run out, and I seen you point your finger in his face and say, In the name of Jesus Christ, come out of him and I see him fall across your feet. After he put his prophecy and said, Tonight I'll knock you plumb out in the middle of that audience of 6,500 people. And said, I seen you stand there, never raise a voice, and said, In the name of the Lord, because that you have challenged the Spirit of God tonight, you'll fall over my feet. He said, I'll show you whose feet I fall over. And I said, come out of him, Satan, and just fell backwards and pinned my feet right to the floor. He said, God is God, Brother Bram. That's all right. So I've had myself nailed in the house for two or three days. He don't pull no punches. He'll tell about it. He's not ashamed of it. He said, do you think i got a gift of healing? I said, forget it, Tommy. You're sent to preach the gospel. Go preach it. Go with Brother Bosworth there. I looked there, and I seen, I started before both of those. I thought, there's Oral Roberts with 500 machines that not even a human hand touches the letter. Four million dollars in the mail last year. Four million. One-fourth of all the money that was taken up in the whole Christian world over. One-fourth of the money in all Christian come into one man. What a place. I went out there to see it. And now, Oral's my brother. <laughs> my, I love him. He's a real fellow, real guy. And I love him. And he just thinks the world of me and I do of him, too. We just don't agree on, on Scripture. And Tommy Osborne, not a better. I just think the world of him. He's one of the finest men that I've met, Tommy Osborne. And those men. And I thought, when I went into their office and seen what they had, I think I'd be ashamed for becoming see mine. One little typewriter and us trying to get the letters out. <laughs> what a thing sitting at the end of a trailer at that time. I thought, what would that be? Then I walked out and I thought, well... Future home of Oral Roberts. The future home of Tommy Osborne. One don't speak to the other one. So I went down the road and I thought, well, what about me? And something said, look up. <laughs> Lord, yes, Lord. Let me lay my treasures in heaven. Well, there's where my heart is. 
Now, I'm not saying that for pity. I'm just saying that because it happened, and God knows that that's right. See, Where is your treasures? Do you want to be some great somebody? If you are, you're nobody. You get to a place where you don't want to be a great somebody. You want to be a humble little servant to Christ. That's the way out. That's all. Brother Bose and them is forming a church in Chicago. They just had to give up the Philadelphia church to that denomination. Now they're talking about getting some guy that's coat back like this, some DD. I said, you're on your road out. If you want to find a real pastor for that church, get a little old humble guy can hardly read his name and his heart's on fire for God. Yeah. Just take that guy. That's the one you want to get. Somebody that don't know all these things. Somebody that won't dictate and drive and throw you into all kinds of debts and everything else and just feed you the Word of God. That's the kind of a person to get. So they won't come to the spiritual feast. I've got to close. I've went over time now. In about six minutes, we'll be dismissing the Lord willing. I hear some say, but Brother Branham, you better back up on that statement saying that people are not neurotics. This people is not neurotics. They are only educated. <laughs> They're educated neurotics. <laughs> That's right? <clears throat> yeah. They're not neurotics. They're educated. Then I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question then. Please explain their actions of today if they're not neurotics. Tell me what makes them act like they do if they're not neurotics. Hmm? Ever fella pulled in for his denomination greedy? Jesus wasn't like that. He wasn't no hurry about nothing. He wasn't greedy. He was our example. Crime? The nation? The nation's got more crime than it ever had. What's wrong? Teenagers, church members, taking lives, men shooting their wives and family, burning up their children. Look at the crime wave. And they're not neurotics? And what's the matter? What's their actions? Power crazy nations, everyone wanting to take care of the rest and make it one flag, one nation, that'd be their flag and their nation? Power crazy immorality? Well, the world's more immoral than it ever was. Nude women on the streets. Nude women and say they're in their right mind. They can't be. They just can't be. Listen, there was one person in the Bible who stripped their clothes off. That was Legion. He was out of his mind. When Jesus found him and gave him his right mind, he put on his clothes. Right. What makes you strip your clothes off? The devil. That's right. And then say they're not neurotics. Start down the street here and drive four city blocks without seeing a nude woman and come back and tell me. All right. Find out. Then you say they're not neurotics? Then what's wrong? It can't be in the right mind. A right-minded woman wouldn't do that. She's got better sense. She knows what she's putting herself out, a bunch of lust devils out there, just dirty, filthy, sloppy, drunky man, murders and everything else. You say, the world is drinking more liquor now. They spend more money for liquor in the United States than they spend for groceries. I think it's, I forget how many times more, the alcohol debt cost each year in the nation then it didn't. What does alcoholism do? Send you to the insane institution. Cancer. When the medical doctors from around the world write in the magazines and tell you cancer by the carloads, cigarettes, put it on rats and prove that it gives you lung cancer. Seventy percent of them take lung cancer from smoking cigarettes. And them women, a man, will puff them right down and blow it in your face. If that's not neurotics, what is neurotic? When the gospel of Jesus Christ can be preached and proved, and the God of heaven in the form of his pillar of fire wave over the people and show that Jesus Christ is in the last session of his coming, giving them the last sign, and laugh at it and make fun of it and call themselves church members, and then say they're not neurotics? Explain that. My time keeps on going. But it's asked if they're not neurotics. Sure, they're educated neurotics. It's exactly. Explain their conditions. You can't. They cut their hair, wear the world with clothes, walk out on the street like that, and God's Bible warns against and even forbids a woman to even pray with bobbed hair. 
and says that a man, if she does that, she claims herself to her husband that she's immoral herself, and he has a perfect right there to give her a divorce and send her away from him. That's exactly right. The Word of God saying that, and a woman hear that, and continue to wear short hair and call herself a Christian, if that isn't a neurotic, what is a neurotic? I want somebody to tell me what a neurotic is then. Yes, sir, neurotics. Highly educated, degrees, college. We put more time on educating our children to, to algebra and biology than we have to the Bible in Jesus Christ. Then a kid in this country can't tell you who David Crockett is. There is a third of them can tell you who Jesus Christ is. That it's not neurotics? <laughs> Certainly it is. How we could go on and on and on. And what do they do? Just remember. And the churches endorse it. When the Bible condemns it, is the ministry neurotics educated neurotics? Exactly. Churches endorse it. Remember Lot. He was a smart man. Look at him just a minute now. Don't, don't, let's not, excuse me for running just a couple minutes over. This is, this is too important. It's going out on. You come to hear me make this tape. Look. Look, let us stop a minute. Pray just a second in your heart. Lord, let me see it. Open your understanding. May God do it. Look at that. Let's take this nation alone. Let's see what God said. The Bible said that the sins of Sodom vexed the righteous soul of Lot daily. He just didn't have the plain nerve enough to stand out against it. Is that right? He couldn't do it, for he was a man of the city. He couldn't, but the Bible said that the sins of the, of the Sodomites vexed his soul. He knew it was wrong, but he didn't have nerve to do it, to stand out against it. Now look, how many lots in America yesterday, reading their Bible to prepare their message for the day and run across the water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ? How many of them run across the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Jesus Christ is saying yesterday day and forever. Mark 16, these signs shall follow them that believe. John 14, 12, he that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also. If ye abide me in my word and you ask what you will and shall be done. How many lots saw that? But because of their excuse of their denomination, it look out and see in the Bible. Look at their congregation of bob-haired women. And they know the Bible condemns it. Look going down the street at their own church members going down the street with shorts on. And they know the words against it, but they haven't got the nerve to call out against it. But yet the man professing to be a Christian, his soul within him cries out against it. But he hasn't got the nerve. If that ain't modern Sodom, where is it at? God give us somebody that'll cry out against it. That's right. Like John the Baptist said, the axe is laid to the root of the tree what we need today. Watch. They're a modern Sodom. Remember. See, the whole land has become a modern Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot, again, living all over. No, living it all over. For his honest convictions tells him by the word that he's wrong. Look in Chicago, greater Chicago, and then 300 preachers sitting there, and the Lord told me that not what they was going to do. They had a trap set for me. Me go on over there. I went and told Brother Carlson, I said, you'll not have it in that hotel. You'll have to take it to another place and it'll be a green room. And they got a trap set for me, had not they, Brother Carlson? He dropped his head. He sat there in my office a few days ago for me to come to Chicago. He said, I'll never forget that, Brother Branham. And I said, they got a trap set for me. Why, Brother Carlson? Are you afraid to tell me why? You and Tommy Hicks? They dropped me. I said, Tommy, won't you go speak? said, I couldn't do it. I said, I thought you said you'd do me a favor. I said, last night the Lord told me, you're going down there today and you find out you're not going to get that building. You're going to another building. Dr. Mead will be sitting on this side. That colored man, his wife, and things will be sitting right here and so forth where they'll all be sitting. I said, there'll be a Buddha priest there. And I said, now, find out. They got it against me because I preached the water baptism in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They got it against me because I preached the serpent seed and against the evidence that every man speaks with tongues has got the Holy Ghost and things. I said, come down and watch God. Got in there, they went down there, and the very two hours, the man, or better. Sometime that afternoon, they called up Brother Carson, and he said, the guy that let him have that and paid a down payment on it. 
said we'd have to cancel because the manager said he'd already promised it to a, a band for that night or that morning, and they couldn't have it. So we went out to the town and country. And that morning when we got in there and stood in there, and, I, and Brother Carlson said, there's one thing you, brother, might disagree with Brother Branham, but said he's not scared to say what he believes. He said, he told me these things would happen just exactly the way they are. He said, now, here he is. Let him speak for himself. I stuck the scripture. I'm not disobedient to the heavenly vision, as Paul said. I said, you've got it in for me for a water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Better than 300 of you introduce yourself as Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so. I said, I haven't even got a grammar school education. But I challenge any man here to bring your Bible and stand here by my side and deny one of the words that they said. You got no tape out here if you want to hear it. That's the quietest crowd you ever heard. I said, what's the matter? Is there anybody here tonight was in that morning meeting? Let's see you hold your hand. Yeah, Lua, sure, look all around. I said, then if you can't support it, then keep off my back. Right. A lot of howling when you're around the corner, but come face to face with the issue, it's different. Right. It's, that man went out. Tommy Hicks said, I want 300 of those tapes to send to every printer, Trinitarian preacher I know of. That man shaking my hand said, we'll come down to the tabernacle and be baptized over. Where's the app? Excuses. I can't do it. My denomination won't let me do it. I married a wife. I bought an ox of yoke, or yoke of ox, rather. I, I bought a piece of ground. I got to go look at it. See? Some of those things like excuses. Is that right? Is that life worthy of the gospel? If the gospel's right, let's set out everything we've got and live for it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Be a Christian. Yes, sir. Amen. Notice time for his clothes. But their excuses is their creeds and their denominations. It's like a tree. I was looking at Brother Banks the other day. I had a, a pine tree I planted when I first moved up there about, oh, about 15 years ago or better. And I let them vines, uh, the branches grow out on the pine tree, and we couldn't get the mower back around there, and there wasn't a sprig of grass anyhow. And I went out there and took a saw and sawed them limbs off until that pine tree was way up here where we could walk on it with a mower, and the prettiest bunch of grass you've ever seen is under it. Now, what was it? The seed was there. It had to get the light. And as long as the denomination or excuses try to shatter that seed that you know actually lays there, you're taking the part of Lot. Throw them things away and let the gospel light shining up on that. The power of Jesus Christ. Yes, keeping the light off of it will keep it from living. For if the light ever gets to it, it will spring forth to life. That's the reason that people say don't go to some of them kind of meetings. They're afraid some of the light will strike one of their members. Remember the woman at the well. She was a prostitute. There stood those priests that seen Jesus telling Nathaniel, I saw you, but when you was under the fig tree, and the priest said, he's Beelzebub. He's a fortune teller. That's the devil. This little woman, when she walked up there in her immoral state, living with six men, and when she walked up there in that state, in that state she was, and Jesus said, bring me a drink, the conversation started. He said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I don't have any. He said, you said the truth. You've got five, and the one you're living with not your husband. She said, I perceive that you are a prophet, sir. I know the Messiah will do that when he comes. Jesus said, I'm he. That settled it. <laughs> when that light flashed across that seed lane and that little old harlot, the harlot days was over. Into the street she went, glorifying. God said, come see a man who told me the things I've done. Isn't this a Messiah? What was it? The light got to that seed back under the shadow of a prostitute shelter. Yes, sir. I just closing saying this. I don't know how many more pages I got, but I, I sure won't take them all. About ten. But that's just about one half through. But let's close in saying this. Let's compare something one time of a life worthy. Let's compare the life of St. Paul to the rich young ruler. The same light struck both men. Both had the same invitation from Jesus Christ. Is that right? They both was well trained in the Scriptures. They were both theologians. Remember, Jesus told, told the rich young girl, keep the commandments that have done this from my youth. He was a trained man. So was St. Paul. Both were well trained in the Scripture. But both of them had the Word. One had it from a knowledge. The other one had the germ of life in it. When that light flashed across in front of Paul, he said, Lord, 
Who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. Here I am. <laughs> he was ready. The light struck both men. One would germatize, the other's not. That's the way it is today. Church spiritual, church natural. The rich man had his excuse. He couldn't do it. He was too weighted down with too many friends of the world. He didn't want to quit associating. That's what's the matter with a lot of people today. You think because you belong to a lodge, you just couldn't forsake that brotherhood. They all drink and things like that and they do this. All right, go on with it. Nothing against the lodge. Nothing against the church. I'm talking about you. Nothing against that. For six of one and half a dozen of the other. I've just got through telling you the church was nothing but a lodge, the denomination, if they deny the Word of God. Notice, the rich man had his excuses. He never forsaken his testimonial. We find out that he went to great business. He had knowledge. And he went to such a place till he had to increase so much till he had to build new barns to put his things in. And when he died... And some bachelor with his collar turned around, preached this funeral no doubt. And when he did, he might have said to half mass the flags and said, Our dear beloved brother, the mayor of this city, now is in the arms of Almighty because he was a great member of the church. He did so and so and so. And the Bible said, In hell he lifted up his eyes, being a torment. See? And remember, he still wanted to hold his profession in hell. He seen Lazarus in the bosoms of Abraham, and he said, Father, Abraham, send Lazarus down here. <laughs> Still calling him Father. See, he took his knowledge and went to an intellectual church. When the light struck him, he turned it down. If that isn't the modern trend of the church today, I don't know it. No matter what God flashes across her path, a pillar of fire or whatever it might be, they still, with their knowledge, they can explain it away and go to the intellectual group for the social standing. But Paul was already in the social standing with great knowledge, a great scholar, under Gamaliel, a right hand to the high priest. In so much too, he went to the priest and got orders to put all them holy rollers in jail. But when the light struck his path and he seen that that same pillar of fire that led Israel through the wilderness was Jesus Christ, he forsook all he ever knew. Amen. He come to life. The Lord. Could you call that rich man's life a life worthy of the gospel that he heard? Though he was a believer, could you call that kind of a life amongst the intellectuals and entertainments that night up there on the, as the sun went down, giving a toast and maybe some priest saying a prayer up on top of there, and he had the entertainments and a beggar laying at his gate down there? And he gave his toast and talked about his great faith he had in God. And before daylight the next morning, before the sun could get up, he was in hell. That's right. There's your intellectuals. But Paul, when the light struck him, let's compare his life and see whether it's worthy. What happened? When Paul, the light struck him, he forsook all his knowledge and got away from that intellectual group. And he walked in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Amen. But as smart as he was, he never even used big words. When he comes amongst some Corinthians, he said, I never come to you with the wisdom of man. <laughs> I never come to you with swelling words because you put your faith in that. But I come to you in simplicity, in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that your faith would be in there. There's a life. Watch it. He never used his education. He never walked with the intellectual bunch. He walked in the spirit of Christ. Humble, obedient to the Word of God, when it was very much contrary to their creed. But Paul saw the light and walked in it. Is that right? Letting the life of Christ reflect Jesus Christ to the age that he lived in. That the people might see the Spirit of God in him. And the humble believed it so much that he even wanted to bring handkerchiefs and to take them off of his body. And they believed it so much as such a representation of Jesus Christ that whatever he touched, they believed was blessed. Yeah. What a man that was. Give his life, his riches, his everything he had, his education for God all. To walk down with fishermen and beggars and bums on the street. To let his lights reflect the love of Jesus Christ. He said, I've been scratched across the back 49 times. 
Don't bother me. She also bear in my body the marks of Jesus Christ, the poor little fellow in such a terrible condition. He said, I'll bear in my body the marks of Jesus Christ. What a difference from this great dignitary with the priest all around him. And when he was at Rome and nobody's standing by him and there's Bill in a block to cut his head off out there. There's what she told us. Oh, my. He said, there's laid up for me a crown that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me it that day. And not only me, but now all them that love his appearing. There's a life worthy of the gospel. Or us run. He stood for Christ. He let the gospel reflect to him. Before he did, he went and learned the gospel. Went in Arabia and stayed three years and took the Old Testament and showed by the Old Testament that he was Jesus Christ. And he let it reflect to him to a humble bunch of people that he, when he said, I know how to have a belly full and I know how to be hungry and wanting. A man with an education like him and a scholar like him standing by the, with a scholarship from Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers there was of the day, and stood arm in arm with a high priest. Brother, he could have been worth millions of dollars and had all kinds of buildings. That's right. But he said, uh, he didn't even have a, but one coat. And Demas saw a man with such a ministry as that. In Second Timothy, the third chapter, he said, Demas has forsaken me and all other men. Loving this present world. Said, when you come, bring me that coat I left up there. It's getting cold. A man with a ministry like that, he could only have one coat. Glory to God. Reminds me of St. Martin when he was trying to stand for the gospel and everything before he was converted. And the, and the pre Nicene, or the Nicaea Council, or the Nicaea Fathers in the history. One day, he was going through the gates there. He was from Tars, France. And there's people in old bum laying there dying. No clothes. And the people passed by. They could have given him clothes, and they didn't do it. They passed him by and ignored the old fella. And St. Martin stood there and looked at it. They said he, every soldier had a, had a man to keep his boots shining. He shined his servant's boots. They took his coat off and took a knife and cut it half into his sword, wrapped the old bum up in it and said, we both can live. He went home and went to bed, laying there thinking the old man had cried. Directly something woke him up. He looked standing in the room. There stood Jesus Christ. Wrapped in that same old piece of garment that he wrapped the bomb in. Uh, that in so much as you have done unto the least of these little ones, you've done it unto me. Amen. That's a life worthy of the gospel. You know how I sealed his life too, don't you? Look at Polycarp standing for the name of Jesus' baptism against the Roman Catholic Church and they burn him to a stake. Tore down a bathhouse and burn him. Look at Irenaeus. The rest of them that suffered for this cause. That's lives worthy. Look what Paul said in the book of Hebrews 11, chapter said they were sawed asunder and pulled apart, wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins and in the desert and destitute and so forth. Lives of this world is not worthy of. There you are. That life's worthy of the gospel. How's mine and yours going to stand in the day of judgment with man like that? Look at Paul now. We're going down. He stood for the gospel and let Jesus throw through flow through him, no matter how, what, regardless of what anybody thought about it. Or the high priest, well, he went and had his head cut off for it. He was a worthy representation of the gospel. Let him, look at there, regardless of what people thought, letting the current of eternal life flow through him in so much that he said, I would be a curse from Christ for my brethren. Amen. Now, you know what you do when you get eternal life? There's your question. There's your answer. You take the intellectual side or take this side. If you've really got eternal life, that's what happens. That's what happened. Paul, ready to be a curse from Christ, to let his people, they're blind, ignorant people that wouldn't listen to his gospel. And I think a shame on my own self. I was ready to give them up because they wouldn't listen to me. I feel like repenting. I have repented. See, Notice, regardless of what others saw, this kind of a life is worthy of the gospel. Now I'm closing. The rich man, like most of us today, shut out and rejected the word of life and become a church member and showed a life that proves in the Bible was unworthy of the gospel that he was asked to receive. Is that right? How could the gospel shine through a darkened light like that, denying the power of God? Now, the only way to live a life worthy is to let Christ and His Word, which He is the Word, reflect itself so perfect in you to God vindicates what He said in the Word. 
For Christ died that he might present himself before God a sacrifice, and it returned back in the form of the Holy Spirit to reflect itself to his people, to carry on his work, reflecting himself through you to fulfill his promised word in these future days. Like John the Baptist heard when he heard Christ come, and Christ walked out into the water, and John said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Nobody else saw it, but he saw it. That light coming down from heaven like a dove. And a voice said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am pleased to dwell in. He saw it coming. And Jesus walked out into the water, Emmanuel, before a, a preacher that was supposed to be a radical. Walked out into the water before the people. And said, I want to be baptized of you. John said, Lord, I have need to be baptized of thee. Why comest thou to me? Both them eyes met one another, a prophet and his God. <laughs> Amen. Could you, wouldn't I love to stand and watch that? See them stern, deep-set eyes of John peel down and find them stern, deep-set eyes of Jesus, second cousins to one another in the flesh? Jesus said, John, suffer it to be so now, for thus it behooveth us, we're the messengers this hour, it behooveth us to fulfill all righteousness. John thought, yes, he's the sacrifice. The sacrifice must be washed before it's presented. And he said, come on, and he baptized him. In other words, it behooves us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus, knowing that that man was genuine, he said, there's never been a man born of a woman like him. More than a prophet. You can receive it. This is more than a prophet. And Jesus, looking into his heart, and knowing that, his own cousin met him there face to face. John said, Lord, I got need to be baptized to you. Why do you come to me? He said, Suffer to be sold, John. But remember, it behooveth us to fulfill all that God has promised. And I am the sacrifice. I've got to be washed before presented. Oh, my, my. And today, when the evening lights are shining, when there's not a man in his right mind, but what can't say? Any Bible scholar looking at the Bible knows this is the last day. Then it behooves us to fall from these big walls or get away from these things and to get into the righteousness of Jesus Christ in this place. Amen. And take on the seal of God before the devil gives us the mark of the beast. Oh, my. Yes. Pray God to let the light of this day raising you to be an obedient servant to God, and then let the fruit of the Spirit ever remain in your life. And that is a life is worthy of the gospel. Let me say this in closing. The only way, the only way that you can live a life that's worthy of the gospel is let the gospel itself, every bit of the gospel, Come in to you and reflect his promises back. Make them vindicated. Let God live in you to vindicate the promises of this day. Just as John, uh, Jesus said to John, suffer it to be so. John, that's right. But we are the messengers of this day and we've got to fulfill all righteousness. And if we are the Christians of this day, let's receive Jesus Christ into our heart. And he is the word. Don't deny any of it. That's the truth. And place it in your heart, watch the fruit of the Spirit upon you, and fulfill every promise that he made in the Bible. God wants to fulfill his word, and he don't have any hands but mine and yours. He don't have any eyes but mine and yours. He has no tongue but mine and yours. I am the vine, ye are the branches. The branches bears the fruit, the vine energizes the branch. That's the life that's worthy. My prayer is to those in radio or in, on the tape land, and those that are present, may the God of all grace of heaven shine his blessed Holy Spirit upon us all, that we from this night henceforth can live a life that God would say, I'm well pleased, enter into the eternal joys that's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. Let the God of heaven send his blessings upon all you people. I pray that God will bless you women tonight that's got short hair. 
in such a way that you'll see and get away from this modern trend of the day and realize that the Bible says that you shouldn't do that. And if you're guilty of wearing immoral clothes, that the God of heaven will shed his grace in your heart, that you'll never do it again, that you'll never be guilty of such a thing again. May the Holy Spirit just open it up to you and show you. May you, without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, may you, man, that's got your wives, and let them be the boss of the house and lead you around. May the God of heaven give you grace to set your foot down and bring that woman back to her right mind again. And realize that that's your place in Christ. Not a boss now, but you are the head of the house. Remember, she's not even in the original creation. She's only a byproduct of you. Give by God to you to take care of you, to keep your clothes clean and fix your meals and so forth. She's not your dictator, you American women. <laughs> Run around with a gob of paint on your face and your nose up in the air that rain it drowns you and then think you're some sort of a dictator. You are to a sissy, but not a real son of God. Right. May God give you, man, grace as sons of God to stop such nonsense as that. Right. May he give you grace to throw them cigarettes down. Stop listening to them dirty jokes. All that nonsense. Let's be sons of God that we can walk a life that's worthy of the gospel. And somebody goes down the street and says, if there ever was a Christian, there goes one. There goes one that God just shows himself right through, and that man is a real Christian. If there ever was a Christian, you might think she looks old-fashioned. She's a genuine lady. There it is. Be a reputable Christian. For we are aliens here. This is not our home. Our home is above. We are sons and daughters of a king, of the king. Let us li- let our lives uh, be a, a reputable life. Let us, li- let us live a life that will honor that thing that we claim to be a Christian. And if you can't live that kind of life, then stop being called a Christian. Because you're only bringing reproach upon the cause. Thank you, people. This hot night sitting here, I trust that there will not be one of you lost it that day. I, I, I trust that you and I together will find grace before God that I'll be able to always stand for that which is true, never to hurt you, but never to pull a punch from you. See, if I would, I wouldn't be the right kind of a daddy if I let my kids just do anything. I'll correct them. Any love will do that. Love is corrective. I remember you write me that note that day, Pat. I've still got it. That love is corrective. The Bible says so. And if it isn't correct, that's the reason God corrects us. He loves us. May we live a life from henceforth that's worthy with sweetness and gentleness. Don't pay no attention and say, well, the best God I know, she's got it. She's spoken tongues. She danced in the Spirit. That's all right. But if she doesn't have the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit isn't there. She's only impersonating some kind of an emotion or something because the Holy Spirit can only live the life of the fruit of the Spirit. That's the only way he can do it. God bless you. Let us bow our heads just a moment. Let the God that has shed forth his life in this last day, that laying here before me of his Bible and the picture of these angels, this mystic light in the form of a pyramid, that even the scientists don't know how it got here. They can't explain it. The Father, we're thankful. You told us months before it happened, and we're grateful to you. Let the people that's called by thy name depart from sin tonight, Lord. Unbelief. May as I've had to speak so rashly against our sisters. It's not because I don't love them, Lord, but I don't want to see the devil wind them up till they drop dead one of these days and then try to meet you in that kind of condition after hearing the truth of God like this. May they feel that they ought to themselves to go search the Scriptures and see if that's right. Get down on their knees then sincerely and say, God, is that the truth? Then that'll be all necessary, Lord, if they'll be sincere about it. For thy word is truth. The people have said, many of them maybe had things that hurt them, but the Spirit of God spoke to them and they sat still and listened. The hour's getting late. The hour's late in the evening and it's also late in the time that we're living in. The sun is going down. The world's cooling off. God, darkness will soon set in. And then the coming of the Lord to catch away his church. How we thank you for this, Lord. We pray now that you'll bless every person in divine presence, everyone that hears this tape, Lord, around the world. May they get away from those old creeds and things and come and serve the living God. Come and invest in it. Do like 
the queen of the south, did she come? Took her three months to get to where a man was representing Jesus Christ, or the God of heaven, Solomon. Jesus said she come from the uttermost parts of the world. You hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, her greater than Solomon is here. And we know the greater than Solomon is here. The great Holy Spirit himself is here, working through the people. How we thank you for this, Father. I pray the blessings. I bless our dear pastor, Brother Neville. Lord, as I, as I look at him and think of his labors of love, my heart just jumps. I love him. It seems as he looks upon his wife and these little children, I, I pray, God, that you'll strengthen him, give him courage, bless him for many, many more years of service in this great harvest field that we're in. Bless all these minister brothers sitting here tonight. Many of them are visitors from other places. I pray that you'll be with them. There's Junie and Brother Ruddle and those precious men who are sister churches to this church here, standing and holding the gospel light in the different parts of the cities around about for this same light contending for it. Thank you for those men, Lord. Encourage them and give them grace to stand the great trials and things that comes upon the earth to prove all Christians. Heal the sick and the afflicted, Lord. Be with us through this coming week now. Give us courage. May them little broken up Sunday school lessons of the day never leave their heart. May they meditate day and night. Amen. Grant these blessings, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask it. Amen. You love him. Amen. You believe him. Amen. Let's sing our good song again. I love him. I love him. As we join ourselves together. Where's Sister Unruh? Is she here? One of them or the sister has played the piano. One of the ladies here. I don't see. Yeah, here she is, the lady over here. That's right. I wanted tonight with all regards, but I didn't see Brother Unger, and I wanted him to sing for me tonight, uh, How Great Thou Art, and I guess the brother went home, see. I heard that song this morning, and I certainly did appreciate that. My, oh, my, that just rang through my heart. And I, uh, I wanted to hear him sing How Great Thou Art. Now let's sing, uh, I Love You. Everybody, get, now just close your eyes. Let's look to him now. Say, Lord, if there's any of this carnality in me, take it out right now. Yeah, right. Take it out. Right. And you out, here's this tape. When you hear this song, sing with us. Then right in your chair where you're sitting, if, is that, if you're condemned by the Word, if you don't think it's a Word, search the Scripture. See if it's right. It behooves you. It means life or death. And then while we sing this song, if there's carnality in your life, won't you raise up your hand in your chair? Have your children and wife to raise up their hand. Your loved ones around you. Saying, I love him and give your life to him. Say, cleanse me, Lord, from all evil. While we sing now, let's stand. I love him. Ah, Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll heal the people. Let's go to wear these handkerchiefs. I bless them in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. And this great blessing, just keep playing it, sister. Just close your eyes and think a minute now. Let's pray in our heart. Lord Jesus, search me. Do I really love you? You said, if you love me, you'll keep my saying. If you love me, you'll keep my word. And then in your heart say, Lord, let me keep your word. Let me hide it in my heart never to sin against you. That's disbelieve anything that you've said. Now, while we sing, I love him, let's shake hands with somebody near us. Just reach over and say, God bless you, brother or sister. Real quiet now. Ah. Ah. And per Now let's raise your hands to him. Oh, Just 
Isn't he wonderful? I pray for each one of you, children. What good would it do me to stand here and say these things if I, in my heart I didn't think it was going to help you? When I'm tired and worn, I just can't hardly stand here. My feet are hurting, and my shoes, I've stood in them and sweated in there and everything, and my feet's galled. And I, I'm so tired, I'm no kid no more. And I preach three or four hour sermons and pray for the sick and going day and night. Why would I be standing here? Today? You know, of all this 30 years, if it was for popularity, I've shunned that. You know I don't take money. You know that. Now, have, have I told you anything in the name of the Lord but what comes to pass? You know that's right. I love you. It's the love of God that's in my heart for each one of you. I wish I could, I wish I could stand before God and say, God, let, let, let me help them. Let, let me do this. I can't do it. Each person has to stand by themselves. I, I, I believe we're all going up now one of these days. And if we happen to fall asleep before that time, I'm taken from you. Remember, I'll meet you over there. I know it's there. The very visions that's told you everything being perfect has come to pass just as he said. No one of all these years can ever hear say that I ever told you anything that would come to pass but what it did. The world over knows that you never seen it on the platform what told everybody the exactly truth. See, Amen. it's always been that same God let me look up past the curtain of time. Amen. And I've seen them women and men throwing their arms around me and hugging me. Said, oh, Brother Branham, I, I just can't sit still. If I'm tired, I go anyhow. My back hurts. And I, I, every day, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 54 years old. You know, you get an extra pain every day. My prayer is, God, hold me together. Hold me together to preach the Word. Stand on that truth until I see my boy Joseph whole enough and filled with the Holy Ghost. I can take his old wore out Bible in his hand and say, Son, carry it to the end of your life. Don't you compromise on it. I thought maybe Billy would preach the gospel. God never called him. But I believe Joseph, even a, a little mean boy that he is, I believe God's called him. That's the reason kids can't get along with him. He's a leader. And I, I, I know that God's called him. I want to train him in the way of the word, the way of the, the word of the Lord that he'll not forsake that word. I want to do it myself, if God willing. And when I get old and sit back and see him, see him there standing in the pulpit and say, this same gospel my daddy stood for, he's standing there old and broke tonight. But I want to take his place and fill his shoes. Stand there. Then I'll look up and say, Lord, let your servant depart in peace. <laughs> That's what I want to see so bad. Until that time comes, then what if I would raise in another generation? I can't. I have to come with this generation. I have to stand with you. You are the ones I have to stand for and give an account before God of the gospel that I preach. Do you think I'd stand here and try to push you around out of something I thought was right? I'd be encouraging you to go do it. But I know that when it's wrong, I want to get you out of that into what is right. Amen. Truly, from my heart, God bear me record, I love you, everyone, with real divine Christian love. God bless you. Pray for me. I don't know what my future holds, but I know who's holding my future. Amen. So I rest in that. I turn the, this pulpit over to a man that I have a supreme confidence in as a servant of Jesus Christ, our pastor, Brother Neville.